Good evening. Uh, today is Monday, July 25th, 2022, and this is the meeting of the Planning Commission for the City of Fairfax. Uh, first this evening is uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, before we get started, um, a motion to admit um, Commissioner Rice to participate remotely, uh, Mr. Feather. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I move that in accordance with the Planning Commission adopted policy that it is permitted by code by the uh, Code of Virginia, Section 2.2-3708.2, to approve the request from Planning Commissioner Matthew Rice, properly submitted in writing prior to tonight's meeting, for remote participation subject to the requirements outlined in the Planning Commission adopted policy and applicable in all or portions of the Planning Commission meeting of July 25th, 2022. Okay, a motion by uh, Mr. Feather. Second. Second by Mr. Eftikari. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It passes uh, six to zero. Um, next is present, um, next is, excuse me, number two, is discussion and adoption of the agenda. Any discussion of the agenda this evening by the commissioners? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Chairman, I move adoption of the agenda as presented. A motion by Mr. Cunningham. Second. Second by Mr. Coleman. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? And that passes a seven to zero. Next is presentations by the public on any matter not calling for a public hearing. Um, would anybody like to address the Planning Commission this evening on any matter not calling for a public hearing? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to item number four, which is consideration of the July 11th, 2022 meeting minutes. Any discussion on the meeting minutes from July the 11th? <coughs> okay, Mr. Feather. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the meeting minutes of July 11th, 2022, as most recently issued. Okay, a motion by Mr. Feather. Second by Ms. Lockhart. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And it passes uh, unanimously. Okay, we will move on to item five, which is items not requiring a public hearing. There <laughs> are none this evening. There are also no public hearings under item number six. Uh, so we'll adjourn the regular meeting and move into the work session. Two items this evening. The first is a progress update on the Camp Washington small area plan. Um, the members um, of Cunningham Quill are here this evening, and Ms. Kluart, I guess you will get us started. So uh, when you're ready, uh, we are. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Ingress and members of the Planning Commission. This evening, we'll be discussing updates on the Camp Washington Small Area Plan with a presentation led by members of the con consultant team from Cunningham Quill Architects. In the final phase of this project, the consultant has refined their initial recommendations presented earlier in the year based on Planning Commission, Council, staff, and public feedback. This effort has culminated in a draft plan that includes final recommendations on guidance for private development and public investment in the study area. At tonight's work session, the consultant will present the recommendations included in the draft plan, as well as summarize the background information that informed these recommendations. Overarching goals for the study area and the recommendations for both the land uses and the transportation network improvements that will allow the city to reach these goals will be presented and discussed as part of this presentation. The plan will continue to be amended in preparation for public hearings with the Planning Commission and City Council in September, where it will be considered for adoption. With that, if there are no questions for me, I'll pass it over to Lee Quill from the Cunningham Quill team for this evening's presentation. Good evening. It's uh, wonderful to be back with you tonight. Uh, joining me tonight, again, my name is Lee, is Lee Quill from Cunningham Quill. Joining me tonight are Nandor Mitrasak and Adam Chamby. Um, the last time we were together was three and a half months ago at the end of um, March on the 28th, and then we had a follow-up work session with uh, Council on April 5th. Um, okay. From our virtual kickoff meeting, literally a year ago, in, or a little over a year ago, on June 9th, through the Planning Commission and City Council work session of July 21, our in-person community charrette at Catherine uh, Johnson Middle School on November 18, 21, 
our in-person town hall presentation at Katherine Johnson Auditorium on February 24th. And our last work session with you, which we just mentioned in, in council in March and April, the city and our consultant team, and obviously all of you, have worked to have extensive interaction and engagement with the community to help meaningfully inform the evolution of this very important activity center small area plan. Responding to community planning commission city council input tonight we will share with you uh, an update on our continuing discussions and meetings with the community. This is both by staff and by the consultant team. We'll articulate the five major goals of the small area plan, provide an update on the vision plan and its three newly defined character areas and provide more detail on the specifics of the plan in these areas, including height, parking strategies, pedestrian circulation, and uh, strat uh, safety strategies. Finally, while the study is still in process, we will brief you on the activities related to the new traffic study being conducted to help inform the discussions and decision-making process related to the small area plan. Uh, one point of reference for you all tonight our team member, uh, Aditya Inamdar, our transportation bike and pedestrian colleague with Kittleson, is unfortunately able, unable to join us tonight because he's ill. You can imagine why. Um, so we will answer the questions and uh, his area of expertise as best we can. We'll be taking the notes down and if we can't give a clear answer uh, tonight, we will make sure we get that back to you. Uh, I will now turn the discussion over to Nandor and to Adam to take you through the above noted information. And we'll be back for questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Nandor. Thank you, Lee, and good evening. Um, since our last work session a few months ago, um, we've had several um, on biweekly meetings with Paul and his team and um, uh, meetings with addition additional meetings with stakeholders. Uh, one of the key meetings, next slide, uh, that we had recently was the walking tour with um, the Westmore neighborhood. And then uh, after that, uh, Paul and his team uh, reached out to the Fairchester uh, neighborhood and also had a stakeholder meeting with the, uh, that community. And we really wanted to, you know, as we, as we refine the rapport and kind of um, think about a lot of the details, we wanted to have a good uh, relationship with the communities, with the commercial property owners, and, and just kind of think, uh, have our feet on the ground and kind of think about um, some of these details um, and and kind of imagine imagine how they play out in the future um, it was a really the Westmore walking tour was a really great um, gathering I think we had a wide variety of stakeholders we had property owners we had uh, lots of community members who were really engaged and we received a lot of great comments um, from the community um, it was good to kind of see the topography and the landscape and kind of just kind of things that you see in real life. I mean, we, we've walked the site multiple times over the last year, but it was good to kind of walk it with the community and have, have the community point out details like, you know, there's missing sidewalks for most of this neighborhood at, the, at this interface along Park Road. Um, it's good to kind of get a sense of kind of the, the gradual and then steep uh, topography change as you, as you look up towards Fairfax Boulevard, um, things like that. And just kind of, uh, we, you know, we sat at the intersection, you know, the various intersections along Park Road, and, and you can kind of see the speeding traffic and kind of, you know, the kind of the mess uh, that some of these uh, uh, this disjointed uh, urban grid creates. So, um, you know, we, we, we and, and I know a lot of you were there um, and you got to hear firsthand um, some of the concerns and some of the actually optimism that a lot of the community members shared with us. So um, it, was, it was great to have this tour and, you know, we, um, we, we hope to, you know, get some of those uh, comments and just kind of feed them into the report. Uh, next slide. Uh, the report, we'd like to start with some of the plan goals, just kind of think big picture. Um, if we go to the next slide, you know, uh, there, Camp Washington is an area with great retail. It's a great location. Um, historically, it's always been that way. Uh, there's high volumes of traffic, high visibility. But one thing that has been lost over time is this idea of, you know, we've had a year's worth of stakeholder meetings and it's very rarely someone describes Camp Washington as a memorable place or a place that they, that sticks out to them or is, you know, ha they've had a great experience that sticks out in their mind. And that's something that we think is a, a lost potential here. 
we really think that it has all the ingredients to be a, a place that really is memorable and can serve the community, serve the region, serve the city very well. Uh, it just kind of needs that spark. So goal number one is to cultivate memorable places within the study area. Uh, number two, and this is something that was reflected in the walking tour, is you have these high functioning um, commercial properties and you know a lot of potential within them. And then you have these great surrounding neighborhoods around them. And we really want to carefully design and kind of think about um, the transitions from, from these commercial corridors to the neighborhoods. And uh, we've put a lot of thought in the document and kind of uh, shared a lot of diagrams and it will continue to evolve that um, in the next you know few months. Next slide. Uh, goal number three is to improve the multimodal environment. And what we mean by this is Camp Washington today and has historically been a car dominated environment. All the details, all the kind of the, the major corridors, the volumes, everything is designed around the car and the experience around the car. Even the commercial properties are, you know, kind of thinking about, they're first thinking about parking and access to retail and convenience. Um, but we see potential in increasing the visibility and the prominence of multimodal transportation. There, there's, a, there's a bunch of middle schools and um, elementary schools around this neighborhood. There's great uh, pedestrian-oriented neighborhoods um, that want to access these properties. And even some of these um, properties, and the, the commercial properties themselves, they, they see a future in multimodal access. So um, we're, goal number three is to really kind of improve the accessibility for non-car uses and non-car um, movement. Uh, goal number four. Um, there's a lack of open, public open space within Camp Washington, almost zero, um, and that's just kind of how it's evolved over time. But we, we think there's a potential for a great network of high quality public open spaces, and and we've even highlighted um, areas where they can fold into ideas of sustainability and stormwater capture, and and really uh, kind of bring high quality open space to this part of the city, which is it, where it's sorely lacking. And finally, goal number five is to allow land uses to evolve to meet future needs. And what we mean by that, in this slide, on the left, you see kind of um, new construction going on in the study area. And, and there will be a lot of new construction. We see that in the market analysis. And uh, there's a lot of potential for new construction. But also, on the right side, um, we have an example of a coffee shop um, in Richmond that um, was an adaptive reuse project. And, and we see a lot of potential here for adaptive reusing of buildings. Maybe uh, the car dealership or the car repair center, you know, may, maybe they move out to a better location and we have this empty structure and maybe that could be a, a, a new retail function um, in the future. So, you know, there, there's opportunities for both adaptive reuse and new, new construction and we kind of want to keep that in mind. And Camp Washington has always been a flexible, ev continually evolving retail regional hub. So we'll see that to um, continue in the future. Next slide. In the final report, uh, we focus on three character areas, um, taking this, this rather large study area and subdividing it into three focus areas. Um, we have Fern Street Triangle to the um, east, and, and this is kind of anchored on some of the larger commercial properties uh, that are around uh, kind of uh, around Fern Street, Lee Highway, and Fairfax Boulevard. Um, to the north, we have the Cutner Park Hub. And this, these are commercial properties that are kind of surrounding Cutner Park, which is kind of a, a great city resource and is, has great location. It's next to the middle school and um, some public resources. But these commercial properties today kind of turn their backs to it. Um, but you know that will change in the future, and we see a lot of potential there. Finally, we have Germantown Village. Um, this is kind of the interface between the city and the county. Um, we, we see this sub area as a kind of a longer term goal. There's, there's a lot of like great potential here, especially you know, with the Dominion property, things that may take a long time to evolve but may unlock in the future and um, really provide a, a, a fantastic interface to the county. Next slide. Uh, we've, we've evolved uh, some of the renderings and uh, kind of the build out plans in the long term vision plan and we'll, we'll do one more update I think before the final plan just based on kind of feedback we've heard from the community and from property owners and just kind of like thinking about um, all of our analysis, analysis up to date. Um, next slide. 
And then we've done some thought into kind of near-term vision plan. And we're thinking about in the next five to 10 years, what are, what are some of the key areas that are likely um, more, more likely to develop? And you know, what, what's kind of our sense of potential um, scales of density and kind of building typologies that may um, evolve? And you know, we see some activity you know, in the Fern Street Triangle area and Cutner Park. Those are kind of more near-term um, potential areas. And then Germantown, again, is a, kind of a longer-term sub area. So with the Fern Street Triangle, um, it's really focused on Fern Street, which is currently, you know, kind of a, a disjointed road, but it, it could, we see the potential of really stitching together the, the uh, residential neighborhoods to the north and south of Camp Washington into the kind of the heart of of the study area. And uh, there are a lot of um, commercial properties that are um, that have stakeholders that have been involved with the plan. They're, they're thinking about um, the need of public open space, the need for uh, multimodal transportation. And we think there's, there's kind of a potential here for creating a center for Camp Washington, some, something that is, um, has maybe a central plaza or some kind of um, public resource that people can walk to, walk their families to, walk their kids. Um, and and create have a memorable place right in the center of Camp Washington. Um, you know this is this is a high visibility area. Um, we have large volumes of traffic on Fairfax Boulevard and Lee Highway. Um, people will see it. Um, so we're really excited about the idea of the Fern Street Triangle. Um, this is a diagram where you know there, there are different types of open spaces. Um, there's kind of um, there's, there's like a dense urban street there with, with storefronts. There's um, kind of an urban plaza, uh, I think number one, the new Civic Plaza at Fern Street. Um, and then there's kind of side and kind of pocket parks, like number four, a new uh, neighborhood open space. You know, that, that specific location of that park may um, vary within that commercial property. And then as we go north uh, in this diagram, which is planned south in, in, in um, in real life, uh, as we transition to the neighborhood, you know, we're stepping down in density and height and scale down to uh, Park Road. Next slide. Um, one detail we've been thinking a lot about since, since our last work session is this Fern Street connector um, and how it connects to the Westmore neighborhood. Uh, we looked at a variety of options. We looked at um, two-way car bound with on-street parking. We looked at uh, one-way northbound uh, with on-street parking. We looked at pedestrian only. Um, our plan is recommending a, um, a pedestrian and bike shared use path connector through um, that resource. And, and it, it will be designed where, you know, it's kind of street-like where it has bollards uh, that prevent cars from accessing it. But, you know, maybe on festival days or um, days where you want more openness and, and movement, you could, you could take the bollards out and just kind of have it have a more open feel. Um, but really the important thing with Fern Street is having a strong bike and ped connection to the heart of Camp Washington and these, um, these great, this network of great open spaces. Um, you know, this, may, this can evolve in, in the future. We're, we're, uh, we're excited about kind of having the first step of connectivity uh, for the Westmore neighborhood. And um, this is kind of where, where we've landed so far. Uh, the next sub, uh, sub area is Cutner Park Hub. Um, as I mentioned before, Cutner Park today is a great resource. It's well loved by the community, but it's kind of back of house for these commercial properties, especially. There's, you know, the parking garages are kind of slammed up against the um, boundary of the park. Uh, the loading docks are kind of aligned at the park. The, these commercial properties don't really like orient themselves or honor the park itself. And that will change in the future. We, we've had great stakeholder interviews with all the adjacent property owners. And, and they do have a development future in mind. You know, maybe, maybe it's near term, maybe it's long term. But um, these commercial properties will evolve. And as they evolve, we want to see a better relationship between the community, Cutner Park, and, and these commercial properties. And we think um, we have a couple key ideas here. One is kind of this new promenade that kind of straddles the interface between the, the public park and these private properties. Um, we've In the next slide, we've um, shown a street section of how that could work um, with this promenade where we have you know, mixed use buildings and then um, active storefronts or active ground floor uses uh, with ample um, sidewalks and, and active frontage. And then you know, this kind of alley or this promenade kind of feel um, really opening up to Cutner Park and, and, and especially from kind of 
Fairfax Boulevard, Lee Highway, Germantown Road, having corridors of view and access um, to Cutner Park, um, as opposed to closing it off, uh, which is the condition today. And it will really, you know, we, we think this will be a great corner of Fairfax. You know, you have the middle school when those, when the parents are picking them up, you know, may, maybe they, they'll kind of walk, walk down and visit this area and really enjoy, have, a, have an afternoon, or you can, you can imagine a weekend, maybe there's like soccer practice in, in Cutner Park, and, and you can really, uh, you know, again, creating memorable places. This is a, a place that will uh, be beautiful and kind of um, have, have, a, have an experience that doesn't exist today. The last sub area, Germantown Village, again, this is more long term. Um, there's a lot of large properties, such as Dominion, that will take, you know, years, if not decades, to kind of um, change and evolve. But um, this is the, the area that um, has a couple of things. One is a lot of transit goes through uh, Germantown Road specifically, but also kind of um, Fairfax Boulevard and Lee Highway. And this, we, we believe that this. Germantown Village is a great location for kind of a transit hub or um, kind of um, people coming from west to east or east to west. You know, they're really going to kind of stop here to kind of go from kind of local to regional traffic. Um, another opportunity is the Dominion site. You know, it's a, it's a very large property right in the middle of the study area. Um, we, we think there's ample space for kind of this um, new public park or a greenway that can be an anchor point and a, a place of memory and um, open space that commercial properties around it can develop and kind of face toward, um, orient the buildings towards. Um, and then we have Government Center Parkway. The city is already investing in Government Center Parkway, um, re, re knitting the city to the county, and, and we're going to get a lot of people from the county actually coming over to Camp Washington. So we want to, you know, this will be a new ga gateway for the city. Uh, another thing that we've been really um, t working with Paul and his team and just kind of working with the community is uh, building heights. And, you know, building heights is a, is a pretty poor proxy for density, but it, it is, you know, something that people kind of pay, pay a lot of attention to. Uh, we presented this first draft in, in uh, February 2022, a few months ago, um, and we've heard a lot of feedback from a lot of stakeholders and, and the community and, and city staff. So. And the next slide, we've refined um, some of the building heights. I think that the core idea is here that within the triangle, we have kind of the seven-story max outside of the, you know, the area around the cemetery. Um, and then as we go from this core triangle area out to the edges, we're stepping down in height. And, and it gets, you know, there, there's a lot of topography into play here and a lot of adjacency issues and, uh, you know, areas that have neighborhoods next to them, we're, we're more sensitive and we want to step down in height. Uh, areas that are, you know, nearby other commercial properties on, on the county side and near Cutner Park and stuff, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at a six-story max, for example. So, you know, essentially we're looking at kind of in the middle, in the triangle, where it's bounded by the three, high, uh, three corridors. We have the seven-story max, and then we're just kind of tailoring it towards um, and stepping down towards the neighborhoods. Um, we, we provided this diagram for the Germantown, Germantown Cemetery. We've worked with uh, those stakeholders for, for almost a year now, and uh, we're very sensitive. We, we, we're proposing a 40-foot minimum kind of no-build buffer around the property line, and then kind of a, a five-story max kind of uh, setback uh, uh, 60 feet beyond that, so kind of 100 feet of kind of buffer around the Germantown Cemetery. Um, in the report, we're going to provide this diagram, which is talking about the new quality open spaces that we're uh, this plan is proposing. And this is something we hope the community is excited about. We've heard a lot about um, the, the desire for open space, the desire of uh, different types of open space, not, not just parks, not just pedestrian plazas, but you know things like um, kind of urban streetscapes, um, pocket parks, minor green spaces, and then kind of the large, really um, kind of uh, leafy and green and um, large green spaces. Next slide. Uh, we've provided models for um, for new streets within the study area, um, and recognizing that this is still going to be a um, a car centric region within Northern Virginia, and some of the retail we, we recognize that a lot of the retail struggles if they don't have ample parking, easily accessible parking. So we've provided uh, street sections with two way uh, two way streets with parallel parking, 
as well as two-way uh, streets with diagonal parking if, if they need a little bit more parking um, kind of in front of retail storefronts. Um, and, and we recommend these street sections throughout the plan. You know, we have some kind of major streets, some minor streets, and some alleys um, within the street network. Next slide. Uh, we've provided diagrams in the report on pedestrian-friendly parking strategies. Um, we recognize that a lot of these building typologies are going to still have a large volume of their customers come in by car from the region, um, not even from local, you know, there will be local traffic and local um, city residents using these businesses, but you know, they, 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 ha they cast a wide net. net. And, um, and so if, if we do have kind of these, these typologies with, you know, large amounts of attention to parking and cars and large amount of retail real estate dedicated to parking, uh, we, we still want to see these businesses and, and new development um, pay attention to the pedestrian streetscape. You know, maybe, maybe they align their buildings closer to the street edge, they create um, street front frontage along, you know, the major corridors, major, major streets, maybe they, they utilize things like diagonal parking. Um, and you know, keep keep the parking to the rear, um, and that way, over time, we're building towards a pedestrian-friendly landscape. Next slide, and even things like big box um, retail. You know, there there will there will be big box retailers in this study area. Um, it's a great location for it, and we recognize that. Um, but even that typology can use things like structured parking or kind of interesting thing in, things in building section um, strategies in. Um, you know, may, maybe building placement within the site and 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 assist towards um, creating this multimodal environment. Uh, as Lee mentioned, Aditya is unable to be here, but um, one, one important um, analysis that we've been doing in the last couple months has been this uh, neighborhood traffic study. Uh, they've set up um, um, major data collection uh, th through the residential neighborhoods and, and within the study area and outside the study area. And um, some of the conclusions are here um, and, and we'll, we'll have a full kind of um, report with all the raw data for you to look at in, in the final report. Um, I think one of, one of the big takeaways is that, you know, there are occasional speeding and, and traffic volumes, but uh, I think what we're seeing is that these these volumes are not close to VDOT standards for cut through mitigation. And that's a statewide kind of generic um, standard. But, you know, we as a city have the, you know, the power to kind of dig deeper and even, you know, set our own standards here. So, um, you know, we, we have heard a lot of community concern about cut through traffic and, and we recognize that we've seen it with our own eyes. Um, and and we, we're working with the city and staff to kind of think about, you know, creative ways to mitigate those concerns. Um, but we will provide the full analysis in the final report. Um, and the last few slides are just talking about kind of the future road network and how we're stitching this kind of uh, disjointed study area into kind of a more um, regularized urban gr uh, grid with kind of better connectivity between the neighborhoods, between properties. And um, and again, making this multi, working towards this multimodal environment. Next slide. And the final slide. And that's it. Okay. Well, we're going to open this up for Q. Yeah, I absolutely. Think me and I uh, and Adam will be available for questions. <clears throat> well, you guys have known me long enough. You know I. We want to have a discussion with you, um, as, best you we, as best we can in this weird environment where we stare at you and you stare at us. Um, so um, would anybody like to, I mean, I have a bunch of questions, but would anybody like to sort of kick it off with a, Mr. Coleman? I just have, I'm just curious. On the property owner outreach slide, if my recollection is correct, correct it looks like it's the two gas stations and that small strip. What, I'm just curious what they're, why they didn't feel like participating or they just never responded or well we'll bring that slide up and then Nandor can address that because um, we've spoken to a lot of people there have been some people that didn't yeah yeah the gas stations you're talking about specifically are you talking about at the intersection of Fairfax Boulevard and Germantown Road um, I think it's the BP which is which is close to the cemetery mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. That yeah. shell station that would be right behind kind of where the Chipotle is. Mm -hmm. And then the I believe the other one next to that is the kind of that small strip mall where Epicure was. Right. And, yeah, and the dry cleaners and the vacuum thing. Okay. And we actually, it's not just... Fairfax or Camp Washington, we see this a lot in a lot of plans where a lot of these gas stations have very complex ownership and, yeah. and they're, you know, they may be owned by a absentee landlord in, you know, Texas or North Carolina or whatever. And it's, you know, the city works very hard to try to reach out to them, but it's like kind of a, a maze of who, who actually owns it and how can we, you know, reach that person. And, and, it, and we have, to, Paul, I don't know if you have any insight on Kind of reaching out to those specific properties, but we, you know, we, we we reached out, we did our best to reach out to them, and I, I think we see this a lot in a lot of plans where gas stations are notoriously hard to just find, mm -hmm. find, and you, you know, even if you physically walk there and talk, try to ask for the owner, you you, you can't get them. So um, you get a PO box somewhere. So that's a generic answer. I don't I don't know about specifically if you have any insight, Paul. On Not necessarily. Just to. Um provide a little background about the information that we were able to provide it and uh, the, the information we have um, that we can share with them isn't always the correct information you need to reach the owner uh, we have our real estate database but that's often um, just a PO box somewhere we don't have a contact name or anything like that uh, in some cases with these property owners we've had people who have reached out to us in the past we have property owners who have been through land use cases we've had some kind of reason to contact the city in the past in those cases we did have a contact with for them and so we shared that with the consultant um so the majority of those is where they were able to get a hold of somebody okay. is the ones where we just haven't had the communication in the past where we weren't able to do it okay. cool and Thank sometimes you. they when, when they go on the market that's when you, you finally find yeah. out so, uh, and i think that is the case with one or two of these properties okay. they, they might be on up for sale Thank you. so there's there's nothing to read into it by the type that we use not type. exclude gas stations specifically, no. no I mean, I guess, I guess what I meant was, I, I'm looking here and I see gas stations, banks, and fast food restaurants. Um, yeah, which are the hard ones to, f okay. they're, they're corporately owned and they're very difficult. To so that, that, I mean, yeah. okay, so that's, in, in your view, the reason why they I may or may so. not have responded and not the use themselves, right? Right. Um, that, that wouldn't be a yeah. use that would be likely to yeah. just tear down their place and redevelop it. Or is it just basically this? It's hard to get to them. I think it's hard to get to them. Okay. I think that's the, and we see this in other study areas too. So it's not it's not unique to. And then let me just say, we started this effort in April of twenty one, and you know it's not for uh, lack of meetings or lack of reach outreach or the city trying to reach contact. You know you you reach out and if people don't want to respond, then that is their prerogative but you know we're trying to reach everybody and we have it's you know we haven't knocked on every single door in the city but we've you know we've been out there so it's you will probably still get somebody who will show up at the, the commission hearing in the fall saying I didn't know anything about this uh, you that's a normal someone will have missed it but um, you know yes <laughs> it happens in every case usually um, okay mr. Coleman any other questions okay um, other commissioners? Mr. Feather? Uh, thank you, and thank you for the work. Uh, sorry I couldn't make the Westmore uh, walkthrough. I was a little interested in the decision for your final recommendation on the Fern Street connector. Um, was that largely driven by community input? Or, because from a transportation perspective, it sounds like there's large value to a, tr a more really true multimodal, I wouldn't call pedestrian and bike multimodal. Um, I was kind of in, always been intrigued by the one way out concept, which might mitigate some of the concerns for cut through traffic. I don't know if the cut through traffic's well, likely let, or not, considering the street configuration. Yeah, there. I'll but let Nando you, you were there and I wasn't, so get into more detail. But as you know, uh, as it continues to come in, you know there is a little bit of a diversity of opinion on what should happen there uh, in the Fern Street connector. Um, Westmore, obviously, uh, there was more people that were concerned about traffic cut through, so they they would like to see more pedestrian. City around that, uh, more people would like to see a connected network of streets and uh, things. So, um, Nando can go into more specifics from the latest community meeting we have, but 
But what we're trying to do is build in flexibility uh, for, for you and council as you're listening to this, first of all, information. And it will be that diversity, so it's not going to be you know, overwhelming in one or another. But what you need to be able to have as a city is flexibility for change over time without major um, upheaval. So right now we're showing a, a narrower road with bollards and walkway, and Nandor can you know, take you back through that. There's a potential for widening that and making it still pedestrian, but then allowing it for it to convert at a later time. Or what we like to see a lot of times are pilot projects where Nano had mentioned a bit about you know a festival or something like that or some activity here in the city um, where you can do a pilot program. Maybe you open it up um, at different times of the year for a period of time and then um, uh, you know, see what the traffic really is. You know, what's it like in summer? What's it like in the fall, et cetera? But still be, and then, you know, close it back down with the bollards so you can get real-time information to help the community inform what happens uh, on Saturdays. You know, is there really cut-through traffic there um, uh, or, or not, or rush certain rush hours? So uh, we would like to build in the flexibility. So if you guys think we ought to widen it a little bit, or something more than what we're doing, uh, please advise us on your thoughts. But um, that's where we are. Nando, anything you want to add? Lee, I think you summarized it pretty well. Um, I, I think uh, the Kittleson team, they, they, they've done a lot of analysis now, and they have, they have a lot of real-time data on the volumes and kind of, um, kind of the wide range of users in that area. And I think, I think even their analysis, and they, they, they usually very strongly promote connectivity and having more access points, even their analysis was a little mixed. Um, it, there, there's some benefits, surely, and we're, we're real. And, and I think, as a general planning principle, we love connectivity. Even you know, street grids, traditional street blocks, um, that's something we always advocate for. Um, you know, opening up to vehicular traffic on this Fern Street connector, it is kind of mixed. You know, it's a, it has benefits and and negatives, and and we're, we're not. Because even the transportation analysis was rather mixed. I, I think we like we we settled on this. Um, you know, we, we felt, number one, most strongly about getting better connectivity for the pedestrians and bikers from Westmore neighborhood over to these commercial properties. That, that's kind of the number one core principle. And, you know, we, we can evolve this over time. Maybe this is more incremental change. And, you know, for the next 15, 5, 10 years, it's kind of the strong shared use path connector that can be opened up during special days or special moments. And then in the future, maybe the, the community and other stakeholders feel more comfortable opening it up more. But you know, we, we feel this is a good first strong step for this connector. Uh, thank you. One of the other uh, transportation related questions I had, you didn't discuss it this evening, we talked about it last time and I had at least a thought. And it was about the frontage road on Fairfax Boulevard that goes from the, the, you know, the major intersection west on Route 50 out toward Be Bevan Drive, say. You didn't talk about your current thoughts on that. Um, have you had any further thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, this is great because you're hitting us with all those that have had great diversity of opinion <laughs> in the city. Um, and again, this connectivity uh, that we're trying to get there. Our, our estimation based on uh, the evolution over time is that while we're showing a long-term vision of a, lo a number of projects, you know, redeveloping to higher in intensity uh, within the, the triangle itself, uh, we we do believe that the areas where the car dealerships are now will remain car dealerships for the near future, even if we go to you know, hybrid or electric, etc. Uh, there will still be a we'll still need to get around and and we're still there's a lot of debate about whether everybody's going to want to get into um you know uh, an autonomous uber type approach uh, there will be some of that obviously as it moves forward but for 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 quite a few years we believe there will be uh, uh still car dealerships or uh you'll find an evolution of buildings like when we were trying to show um uh, where you had the building in, in Richmond for Rostology, which is the gas station, what became a um, uh, coffee shop, which is in the museum district down there. It's, it's actually a, a beautiful rendition. Uh, they got, uh, we didn't have it in the photos because I missed that when I took it, but uh, 
there's outdoor seating, et cetera. We think that there will be adaptive reuse of these, air, these buildings along um, the northern side of Fairfax Boulevard uh, into places like an REI or something that uh, meets the values of the places here. So what that means is there's a strong debate about whether you take that road out and put the uh, you know, wider path in and create a, a turn lane off of, uh, of Fairfax or whether you leave that there. And especially with the cars, people have been coming back and saying a lot of people are test driving uh, their automobiles, at least to some degree, getting a feel for it in that area. So um, I don't think there's a, a, a very singular direction that we've been able to identify within the city. Anything like that? I just want to add a little bit to this. Um, so we, we also talked a lot with the community about this idea. And in general, there was really wide support for the idea of a shared use path that's like, you know, great for biking, kind of cleaning up that view of those car dealerships. Um, and But there was some discomfort a little bit about having that right turn lane and about that access. Um, you know, Kittleson has done a lot of really, really hard work and demonstrated that in general that right turn lane would work. Um, it needs more analysis. Each of those properties is very different in the way that their access is. So a lot of our framing of this is also thinking about it more in the long-term plan rather than a immediate turn. Um, you know, as we mentioned with the redevelopment of some of these shopping centers, there's going to be more and more opportunity to do this. Um, but a big part of it is about doing it right and doing it with further study and with in concert with maybe one of these, uh, one of these, at least one or two of these being redeveloped. Um, but in general, you know, I think it's something that we feel pretty strongly should be in this plan in some form, um, and we're we're kind of grounding it in that kind of long term. Adam, do you mind pulling up the slide? Yep, um, this is the should be on the board right now. The section of the. Um, linear park with the right turn lane and then the existing condition as well. Um, so I think one thing that all stakeholders and, and all the participants of this study can agree is that this access lane is kind of underutilized. It's, it's a lot of space and it's kind of a waste of space and, and kind of if you, if you observe the daily use and just kind of what, what it represents and what it does in, in reality. Um, and we strongly believe and we've drawn, we've provided and recommended this in the plan is over time converting this into kind of a greenway for the community that provides better connectivity. It, it's free land, we, we, can, we, should, we should use it. Um, and Kittleson has demonstrated, like Adam mentioned, that you know, by adding this turn lane onto, um, onto the boulevard, we, we can kind of mitigate any if most traffic kind of um, transition issues and kind of access to these properties. So uh, we have provided the vision uh, again, we think this is more of a long term. This is not kind of a near term. We have to do this right now type of idea, but um, we, we've provided and recommended this in the plan. I hope that's clear. Yeah, because because the, the 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 idea that struck me last time that I mentioned that making this multi-use vehicular, but one way from like where the mattress warehouse is up mm -hmm. in Bevan, and still providing some place for the car carriers to to be. Right. But not make it a two-way, full two-way like it currently is. It, I, mean, I think you'd probably leave it two-way from that point uh, okay. east to, to service all those other businesses there. I see if that's a valuable entrance point. But anyway, uh, you know, you still might want to entertain that idea. As we did, concept in the we actually did drop multiple options for this, and I, I believe we presented it to you all. Yeah. Maybe in yeah, the I'm past. not sure we talked about that a one-way okay. sort of thing from that point. And maybe we'll provide an appendix. Anyway, maybe we'll take a note. Whatever. And, you know, we, we've, we drew like three street section options looking at that yeah, yeah, very much. passage road. Yeah, and yeah. We'll provide that for, for reference. Um, you also showed some diagonal parking options. Do you have a concept of where those might be? From a traffic standpoint, those can be disruptive depending on the kind of road they're on. Which sure. Back I mean, they're the not going to be on Fairfax Boulevard or are the main arterials. Uh, th these will be um, kind of the, I think in our road network, the red streets, which are kind of okay. not the primary arterials, but maybe the okay. main now retail streets. And, um, and that's a concession to kind of, you know, the car nature of Northern Virginia. And, uh, you know, kind of, we've seen in some areas <laughs> within, even within the study area, if you don't have 
quick accessible parking that those retail storefronts die like that that use just cannot is not viable and we recognize that and you know our ec economists are, are mindful of that as well so for what it's worth where we spend summers in maine they went through this the small village of eliminating diagonal parking on the mm -hmm. main street and all the businesses were up in arms that their That's businesses right. would die but they put relatively close large well-lit public parking places and they've actually been very successful so yeah california um, actually does a lot of diagonal parking pretty well you know in, yeah, in but, kind of but the beach this town took stuff. them out yeah and, and the businesses didn't die and others have that's come true in, yeah so yeah. i think it's just a question of getting used to the new concept and, and taking the walk right um i think that's all i had questions about i'll go back and look at the red areas to thank you thanks mm -hmm. i'm willing to bet that people are much less mad in this part of Maine than they are here in Northern Virginia. <laughs> oh, don't be stupid. Not <laughs> um, uh, any, uh, any more questions? Um, Mr. Eftikari. Gentlemen, um, thanks for the update. Very well done. Um, quick question on slide uh, 32, going back to uh, uh, Commissioner Feather's comments. Um, what, what so? Just that second bullet, traffic volumes and speeds, not anywhere close to VDOT standards for cut. So what about, so the speed, uh, that's the, the, I think we talked about that. So if you look at the, if you look at traffic coming down Lee Highway to make a right on Fairfax Boulevard, um, right up there, what, it's, were, did folks discuss their concern about the speeds of cars going through that green arrow? Did, were, did folks talk about, um, you know, um, speeding on Fairfax Boulevard. Did they, any of that was mentioned at all during your, your sessions at all? Because I'm curious, I mean, forget about VDOT standards, but what about community concerns? I think this, this bullet point is referring to um, traffic volumes and speeds within the neighborhood streets, like Park the neighborhood Road. Neighborhood streets, yeah. not on Yeah, not, not Fairfax Boulevard and Lee Highway, but rather these residential streets. Right. You, you can see in the blue dots, that's, those are kind of the traffic um collection areas right so then i think you made a comment that there were solutions or tools that we as a city could use to address you know certain issues but so i, I guess i turn this to our fellow commissioners and to staff what tools do we have or solutions do we have for traffic and safety issues i mean because i'm dealing with it personally on in my neighborhood and it's almost as 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 there's nobody really wants to step up i think it's almost as folks are inept in terms of actually putting down some type of solution. So before we start another issue here, what solutions do we have? What tools do we have? Can we say as a commission, there are some issues here that we need to engage somebody, some department, because someone may get killed? I mean, I'm just putting that out to the to everyone here. I mean, does anyone? And I'll, I'll actually, this is a really good conversation. And I'll, Adam had a really insightful conversation about Park Road and kind of how it has some blind corners and it's just kind of a unique to park road itself that, that was kind of kind of the poster child of some of these traffic speeding cut through issues mm -hmm. um, we had property owners that live on the corner of certain intersection and they sit on their porch and they watch they're telling us every day they see people speeding through their neighborhood and just kind of you know sit here and you know i, I see it every day it's like you know it's real um and you know as actually the walking tour is perfect because we we actually walked the length of yeah. Park Road with the community and just kind of heard their stories and we can kind of see people driving through and Adam you had a good description the other day yeah you know um, when you're the the street is very windy you have these big tall trees somebody maybe is even going 25 miles an hour but you don't see them coming because of you know the turns of the roads you know and you don't have a sidewalk so you're already kind of forced onto the street um, and so a lot of it's it's not to say there isn't also people going wildly fast that does happen as well but um, a lot of the mitigation can just be you know adding that sidewalk creating stop signs in regular intervals things that can kind of start to slow people down as they move into it is starting to be sort of what we're thinking about and creating uh, visibility you know as these sites um, redevelop like a long park road there is that opportunity like the Fern Street connector to kind of create a really clean vegetated access point where you can visibly see what's going on around you a little bit better um, and I think that's probably something that's pretty typical in a lot of communities around here a lot of the urban design plans in the 50s 60s 70s even up to today were about these kind of curvy roads that are 
slow moving in the rural times, but now that we've gotten busier and busier, it's not necessarily, you know, as desirable, so. Another thing about Park Road is, uh, you know, it's it's two lanes of traffic and then on-street parking, but it's not like marked. So it just kind of, it's kind of 40 feet of pavement and it's kind of windy and, you know, just kind of like, there's not much there, so people are just kind of, I, I could see why people are kind of, maybe not even speed, even like someone going 30 miles an hour seems really fast because it's kind of blind corners and just kind of, you're going through a residential neighborhood. So um, it, it, it's kind of, um, and, and to be fair, Park Road is outside of, technically outside of our study area, and we, but we do talk to kind of providing things like uh, Adam mentioned, sidewalks and, you know, kind of the be a better um, kind of, we think kind of regularizing some of the grid and, and making it more traditional um, in terms of um, uh, intersections and and um, kind of str traditional streetscape will help you know psychologically at least slow down the drivers or like at least having them respect it as a community as a as a neighborhood if they're coming through the neighborhood. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. I live mm -hmm. within a block as does Commissioner Rice of four-way stop that no one ever ever stopped at um, despite there being police presence at that intersection at least one day a week if not more frequently it doesn't seem to be a deterrent people just roll through a four-way stop I think the one thing that changes that makes people pay attention is when there's people actually walking through the intersection so the, as much as you can activate the pedestrian aspect or just like the people in and out aspect of these neighborhoods and these streets I think that's what will kind of make the switch flip over people oh people live here I should probably be careful <laughs> But yeah, I don't know how you change the human factor of driving through intersections and driving through neighborhoods as if they're just speedways. Well, a number of tools that other jurisdictions have used that I know are probably in your, um, I hate using toolkit or your, your, your bucket or whatever, but um, I know if uh, maybe staff is probably looking at some things that you may not be aware of, but in other locations, um, the, the road diet component we've taken two two lanes each way four lane roads and made it one lane each way with the center turn this is for a major road now not not park we're not talking a major as a turn and added bike lanes on the on the exterior and it narrowed it down so it's like a it's a, a, a road diet and and there were a number of people that were just like up in arms uh, on this it's like how can you take these roads you know just two lanes away uh, and yes, during the height of rush hour, uh, it's a little bit slower, a little bit slower than what it was before, but every other part of the time, the road is much more pedestrian focused. Plus, they put in the crosswalks, like you were saying, it's clearly identifying crosswalks with great, you know, like the white stripes. Uh, um, even in this one, they have concrete um, uh, refuge in the middle, and then the, 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 the bumps or inside where you know you narrow the road down um, there's also things I'm not sure exactly um, Aditya would know the exact terminology but part of the pedestrian um, visual site work that's being done in a number of cities uh, I live in Alexandria and they've literally come in and painted out gray areas to, to make instead of just on a, on a curve where you can just take a quick it's you got to make it like a, a very short turning radius they will paint in the gray area to stay out of and they put in these little bumpers that are about 18 inches long and about 12 you know maybe 10 to 12 inches tall so if you go over it it's going to you know mess up your car and that that slows traffic down also so there are a number of ways where you start to do road diet work with pedestrian circulation, work with bikes, et cetera, that you, you can uh, bring it down in addition to the streetscape, so. Mr. Quill, um, when you say we, when you say they, is, are you talking about the they. city of Alexandria? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that I think I may have said this, I don't even know if it was this past meeting, it might have been last year. Um, you know, one thing I've written down on a number of pages, I just wrote the same two words um, is policy prescription. Now, you, you might say this will become policy of the city, and it, it might, um, and it probably will. Um, but some things a little bit more detailed along the lines of these types of measures to specifically spell out, I think, can help. Um, and I think one of the things, and you know, maybe this is partly on me, on the, on the downtown, 
you see a lot of interest of, in development, but I don't think our plans in the city, in this policy way, have kept up with addressing all the new people that will be there because there is just a ton of speeding. And it's not going to go away until the cars are physically constrained um, in a way that, that Mr. Cole just described, at least to me. And I'm not an auto expert, but it's not really like rocket science like that. Um, so, uh, you know, I just feel like sometimes we can use this as an opportunity. And I think Mr. Eftikari brought up a good point. What are the tools we can? Well, one of the things is to specifically say in here that these things are likely to be accomplished number one, by these types of efforts, and number two, by public investment, because not all these things are going to happen with the developer. Um, so, and some will, um, but some won't, and some can't wait. So I, you know, I don't, that's a hard job for you guys. Um, the staff is probably going to have to be involved in something like that, because I don't know the limits of what the city can and can't do. Um, every time I hear the, the term MUTCD, I just want to, like, run out of the room. Um, so, like, we obviously need people who know that to, to deal with it, but I think that that's a way to think about it. Um, that's how I've looked at the downtown, the smarter plan in the downtown. There are actually good, good examples of how to road diet um, in there. Um, so that's, that's something. But how you do it, how it is accomplished, I think, is something that perhaps – might be a beneficial in here, especially because this area is particularly um, dangerous, <laughs> um, or can be. So, uh, the reason I said we on the right. <laughs> earlier thing in Alexandria is uh, I'm on the design review board for Carlisle on the East Eisenhower, and I actually was involved in some of those <laughs> things for that particular area. So, yes, so thank you. But they, being the city of Alexandria. Right, right. I'll just close on this, is that cities have much more control over their street network, as you know, than counties, which are subject to um, dealing with VDOT more. So that, that gives us great hope because, I mean, you know, uh, the city does have these opportunities, a lot more to control things in their jurisdiction than uh, the counties do, which are um, more uh, have to defer to a VDOT. So that's what we're referring to. Okay. Okay. I mean, because if you if you if you suggest a policy, right, or a, a way. I mean, the zoning ordinance or our other, other ordinances can be changed to say, for instance, in this area, the buffers need to be wider or they need to be different or they need to utilize more, you know, uh, modern efforts to separate cars from pedestrians or other people or other uses. Um, so I just bring that up. That's, I threw a lot out there in that, but I do think that that's potentially helpful. I don't know if that addresses exactly what what you said, but um, no. there are any other comments on that? Add, yeah, go ahead. So just um, so that from the corner of Fairfax Boulevard to Bevan, that uh, side street, I guess. You can call it Dealership Drive, whatever that road is right there. <laughs> I like when, that. When, <laughs> when, you put the, when you put the trees and the bike paths there, how, are, how do the tractor trailers, the car trailers, how are they going to get in there to offload their cargo? I mean... So the, the, you know, if you come down to our to the other end of North Fairfax, what the cars, what the tra trailers do, they just pull into residential streets and dump their cars. You know, they offload their cars. So, which is a which is a big issue for safety. Um, you know, the city you said that has more has a little bit more flexibility in terms of what they, you know, the way we've been instructed as a resident as residents is that a sign should suffice that you can't park here, but. No one pays attention to the sign. So how are you going to kind of mitigate that on the, from that end? Where are those tractor trailers going to park? Why, just a change of time that we've talked about. You know? Yeah, we have heard that comment that the, the frontage road or, or dealership drive, <laughs> that's a good, that's a good <laughs> okay. one. There's a couple uh, of them. Th That's kind of the current location where the trailers are pulling into. And, and technically, they're not supposed to park there, but that's in function in reality. Because a lot of these dealerships are not designed to accommodate the full trailer and the radius and, yeah, and kind of the large sweep. Yeah. So uh, we recognize that. And that's why we're not super, you know, saying we're, we're not saying that this is a, a near term must have change. And we recognize that. I, I think the, the, the idea is that in the future, these car dealerships may change use over time. And as they do it, we're, we're building towards this street section of, of this frontage road turning into a, a resource for the community. Um, but yeah. it's a really good point, and we'll think about that some more. Yeah, no good stuff. Thank you. Mr. Cunningham. Thank you. Uh, a couple of areas to ask questions on. One, in 
looking at it and I didn't see one of the slides that was in the material I was provided in our briefing here, but it talked about short-term redevelopment and longer-term redevelopment. Uh, when we look at overall redevelopment in this area and the overall slide, there, there are various people, as you said, you haven't talked to, but I presume they would go along and play or they might not. Uh, when we get to redevelopment and talk about the percentages of redevelopment for what's going to be there, residential is a big factor in redevelopment of this area. So we're going to bring a lot more people in. And I think that was one of the topics that I had touched on the last time we talked was wh where do we look at for short term and long term the residential portion of this redevelopment going? How many, how many people are we bringing into this area from that standpoint, or are we expecting to bring into this area? I think you have the numbers, but uh, yeah, we have areas that we think <coughs> develop more quickly than others. So. Yeah, we, I, th I think in general, we're seeing a lot of interest in residential uses coming here. You know, there's, there's not a lot of rental properties within the city in general, and especially, especially in Cap Washington. Um, the Moxley is kind of the first new residential project in a very long time. Um, and, and it's the first residential project within the study area in, in decades, really. So, um, and that will continue. It's, you know, I, I think having observed this local regional market for almost 20 years now, you, you see, you know, retail has, has kind of five years of, of trend and then residential kind of follows and then office. Kind of, you know, there, there are different phases of the, the real estate market um, right now. There's a there's a regional housing shortage. Um, rents are you know the rents the the apartment supply is very constrained, and this is a very good location for you know students for workers in the region people that you know work in Reston or Tyson's Corner or even the district. It, it has some accessibility to Metro, um, so you know Camp Washington is a very strong area for residential mixed use uses, and um, I, I think in broad terms what we're seeing in the near term is. A strong residential demand, um, retail. You know, had had a dip in COVID, but I think we're seeing it come back pretty strongly, actually, especially in regions like in areas like Camp Washington. So we're actually very optimistic about retail. Um, it may not like in total numbers rise quickly, but it will st stay the same or or increase over time, and it will evolve. That's kind of the key thing. These. You know, adaptive reuses, new construction, um, reskinning of some of these older properties. Um, uh, office, uh, you know, I think the office market with with COVID and working from home, that's kind of on a downswing regionally, not unique to Camp Washington, but you know, I, I, I think we'll, we'll see that trend play out here. And but then there are special uses like um, industrial or kind of unique unique cases that you, you could see easily playing out in Camp Washington. So. Uh, you're right. In, in bro kind of in general, we're seeing a lot, a lot of demand right now, today, in 2022, for residential, and that will continue in the next five years. Um, and, and and we're optimistic about retail. And and you know the hotels may may stay or leave. It's not going to be a strong hotel market right now because there's a lot of regional competition. But we do see a place for hospitality within the region. Maybe one or two new hotels. I think just to be very clear. Uh, that's why we have a, a near-term and uh, a long-term vision, because uh, it'll take a while to get to the long vision if you ever get there. Because what happens is, as you know, the, the wonderful thing is, you know, we always talk about this in a statement I like to make. is like, you know, growth will happen. It can either shape you or you can shape it. So what Fairfax is doing in this area of the city is shaping, trying to shape and guide through thoughtful dialogue with community and, and decision makers, where where we go, what it is, how it works, et cetera. That's what these small area plans are about. So by doing that, you set the vision out there, and that, that starts to spark people. Uh, and plans that we and I have been involved in over 30 years, um, there's a plan that I was involved in in the early 90s. And I remember my little diagram that showed Axon of where all the development would happen. And a lot of areas didn't develop. But within the last three years, five sites that were never envisioned to go for, you know, quickly have all of a sudden popped up. There was a critical mass that started to turn. So I think what you'll find here is you'll find 
uh, retail developers or retail owners of property take a look at a site and say, hey, can I work with maybe doing a piece of infill on a portion of that and still keep my retail going? Because it's income producing and, and desired. So there may be incremental changes as we've talked about. And then eventually, as things start to mature and they see where it's going to go, it'll happen. So there are a number of sites that people we know are starting to think about or looking at that I'm sure you'll be hearing about, um, so which has been sparked by this whole process. So that's actually exciting. That's, that's what you want. Okay. I gather what you're telling me is we're going to have a lot more people living in Camp Washington's area. Uh, and as such, that's, I guess, good news in the long time, as it was described 25 years ago in the 2020 plan that was done by the city and some things along that line. Uh, discussion was back and forth and you were going to have to bring people in these areas to provide the client base for most of the retail that's going to occur and then other portions of that will migrate in to use good retail. Mm -hmm. So w with no people there you're not going to get the retail and everybody coming in but with people there you'll get both migration in and local and that makes it successful. So some of those principles carry on for a very long time. Uh, in going there. I guess flipping from that one, one would be quantity of who and how that's going to go that would be interested in a little more of to see who and how as it goes short term and long term because this is one portion of the city where there's a lot of interest in residential development. Uh, in fact, as you know, we've been talking about affordable housing for a long time. More recently, as you're aware of Alexandria, they're talking about mid-level housing and how do we get more of that. So housing is an issue that's here to stay and we have to deal with it going forward. When we look at transportation, uh, and I realize that the expert isn't here tonight, I know there were studies done on transportation on Fairfax Boulevard, on Lee Highway, and this program will be dated very quickly when that name is changed right after you publish it and, and it comes out new. Sure. Uh, and things along that line, but when we look at the major road structure in there, Germantown, uh, Fairfax Boulevard, Lee Highway, we have transportation studies pre-COVID as to how busy it was. Mm -hmm. Do we have any that are relatively current to say what impact has COVID had with the major changes that have gone on in the last two years? Is the traffic down substantially on those major roads as we're looking forward? And what might the impact be going forward if we're going to bring a lot of people in there to get into the safety measures to make that area safe? Uh, right now, I don't believe you've got many pedestrians along any of those major roads mm -hmm. on a given day. You have a few that are back in there. But if you're going to bring a lot of people in and make it walkable and accessible and bikeable, mm -hmm. then they're going to want to cross the, the major roads in that so that that transportation study, I feel, is is critical to to who and how it's going to redevelop in the way we would like it to redevelop. It will redevelop but may have unintended mm -hmm. consequences otherwise. You, you touched on a lot of really good topics and we'll, we'll forward your question on to the Kittleson staff and kind of get their, their response. Um, I, I do want to say, well, and this is something we've talked about a lot, is Camp Washington right now today has a lot of single use properties. In fact, you know, when you look at it in totality, it's a lot of retail strip centers that all have coinciding peak hours like on a Saturday morning it's it's everyone's going to the Walmart they're going to the kind of the the, uh, the Aldi you know the, the the major strip centers and I think by bringing in you know and in the near term you know maybe we'll see a thousand units in the next three to five years come in residential units in, in a mixed-use kind of format um, those users have a different peak hour system, they have a they, it kind of mixed use communities have a, a unique attribute where the traffic patterns don't have like kind of these high swings in traffic volume, but rather they're kind of more more tightly regulated. Like the office users are different from the residential users or different from the retail users. And and when you add that all up, it kind of evens the traffic flow out. So yes, theoretically you have more people there, but it actually has a more balanced traffic flow. Um, and that's something Kittleson has talked about, and I think they write in the report um, and write to that point. Um, 
much of that I think will be impacted along with those roads being major major transit roads mm -hmm. because of the area and you have right. an accident on 66 and all of a sudden mm -hmm. you find all of those people coming out using these roads yeah we uh, think so the moxley has 400 new units and we, we think about they're in the middle of the triangle right those kids are going to the middle school or you know go to the community going to the dog park you know those families are walking around that, that's you know as these properties within the triangle develop your point is well taken we, we need to design these crosswalks these you know kind of just think about the pedestrian quality and yeah. safety yeah, that going forward. Uh, the city of Fairfax has typically felt it was a small town and wanted to maintain that kind of atmosphere. In much of what we're doing in the study and the report, I see the word urban. And the word urban to me is not small town. It's dense. It's multi, multi-purpose, multi-function. Uh, residential and that closely packed much as many european cities are where you've got a whole lot of stuff and you get out of town and you've got a lot of rural area around it i'm not sure where we're headed in that but my sense is that because of our geographic location close to dc in a rapidly growing economic area we are headed toward urban even though we like to use small town so the density we're talking about is headed toward urban densities, at least in these five areas. And by developing these five areas uh, in town, we may be able to keep some smaller density in Old Town mm -hmm. and some character, mm -hmm. as opposed to rebuilding the whole thing, trying to depend on f four historic buildings that we're going to, to have parceled out much like going to the Alamo in San Antonio. Uh, when you hear the stories of the Alamo, you're awed. You go and see it, and it's a small, tiny park that we can put in downtown, surrounded by big office buildings, and now you don't understand the, you know, the significance or the context. I was going to say something, and you, you basically took my thunder by explaining exactly what it is. The only thing I would add is that, um, you know, uh, when Fairfax was established, it was urban compared to where it was, uh, and portions of this city will be more urbanized, um, as you described, as we grow, because we will grow, the city, the region. Um, again, how do you shape that? So by going to the activity areas outside of downtown, which is a cultural hub and the arts hub, um, you'll be able to protect that. You know, there's a, there's a part of it is a small town, you can have a small town feel where people talk to each other, they get out together. That's what we're kind of trying to target here, of those places of coming together, um, of sharing with your neighbors, being able to walk to places. Uh, right now, you know, Camp Fairfax is, or Washington is very difficult. I mean, you can't, you gotta drive. Um, and we're at a vision that all the participants have talked about is to bring about a place you can walk and gather and, and neighborhood um, gathering. So, um, you explained it very well, but this is, this is how you protect the overall culture and, and um, place of what Fairfax is known for, as opposed to turning it into a suburban sprawl, totally. So you explained it the best. I, I just wanted Adam to pull up the, uh, the one slide with the comprehensive plan. We, we've really studied the comprehensive plan and, and reading the language of the plan. You know, it highlighted these five small, area, five small areas as I don't know if we could pull up that slide. The city's not big, you know. It's it's kind of a within the city of Northern Virginia. It's it's small, and um, you know, if growth was to happen within the city of Fairfax, I think the comprehensive plan nailed it. It's these five purple areas that really represent the kind of the they're the exciting locations, and and I think if you if you like reduce growth in these five areas, you, it'll show up somewhere in the city, you know. You know, it will probably be in places that you may not actually want this density. So, you know, I, I think a lot of attention, we've paid a lot of attention, a lot of analysis on Camp Washington, North Fax, Old Town, and th those are the exciting areas within the city. And I, I agree with what, what you just said. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Um, I actually don't have anything to add. Um, one of the big ones we talked about earlier about safety. Um, I, wouldn't, I won't say that that's missed 
in our small area plans. It's not. I just don't think it's emphasized enough mm -hmm. um, because it's very car centric in a number of these areas, and it's it 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 can be easy to say that we're interested in creating an environment that's safe for all, but it's much much harder that you guys know to, mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that type of oomph, <laughs> perhaps in this plan, is is warranted at least in my, in my personal view. Um, do you guys have questions for us? Um, I know that this is the last time we're going to meet um, before the final uh, plan. Is that right, Mr. Nabti? Yes, that's that's the current plan. That's the next plan. meeting would be the public. Okay. Um, is there anything we didn't address? You need us to anything like that? Paul, do you, we we had a long conversation. Do we do, we had a small list of things that we wanted some discussion on. I, I think you've covered everything. Yeah, I think we covered everything. Okay. Yes. Okay. The only thing I would say is obviously a small plan, a small area plan um, can make a lot of recommendations, but, and, and give a guidance for where implementation can go. But uh, again, it comes back to planning commission, city council to, to say, this is what I want done. Um, you know, we can't dictate that in a plan. We can make recommendations of what should happen. Um, but the things we're talking about on pedestrian safety, you know, this is not the first time, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you have raised this. I remember those discussions for Old Town and the concerns. So there, it's the how places become urbanized with cars more than anything else. So how do you get the pedestrians uh, safe? So I think we can add a little bit more Oomph, as you said, or the detail to some of these rec potential recommendations. Um, but I, I, you know, I know from our discussions with uh, the city staff that you know this is they're involved in looking at this, and um, I, I don't think I, I don't know all the specifics. We don't know all the specifics. Uh, Paul could probably talk to more of that, but I know Wendy and the team are looking at that. Planning is looking at that. Um, so this is definitely on their radar too. So we can give you a little, a few more recommendations. But if that's really important, I mean that's what should be put in your recommendation to council. It's like we need to implement uh, policies and, and actually get it on the ground for these ideas of road diets and pedestrian first, etc. I mean, right now the problem with Camp Washington is uh, you're taking your just like the old town to some degree, but much more out there is. Uh, you're taking your life into your hand trying to get across because of all those distances you saw. At least Old Town has a grid that you, you know, can, if people will stop, they'll do it. We're going to create a grid out there, uh, and that gives us great hope for the connectivity of stopping. It's getting like you were talking, four way stops don't always work, but um, other cities where they have a grid, where they have four way stops, I mean, yeah, some people will run it. And after they get stopped by the police a couple times, you know, it happens. And most people are respectful enough of a four-way stop because people will be crossing. So uh, I, I wouldn't say they blow by it all the time. So, so uh, I think otherwise, Adam, you got anything? I was just going to point out um, <coughs> one thing to really keep in mind is the idea of this incremental change, doing demonstration projects, testing things mm -hmm. out. Um, we're really emphasizing that in this plan particularly because people can't imagine a parking lot as a gathering place, but if it temporarily becomes a place occupied by food trucks and activity, then suddenly you're like, oh, okay, this could be a place that we could go and walk to and imagine. So um, looking and trying to identify those moments, I think can also start to test out those transportation concerns, can start to test out, hey, what if we did close the service road for you know, a week or two, like, let's see what happens. Does it actually cause that impact that we're worried about? Um, so I think, you know, we're really encouraging kind of pushing those kind of ideas in this plan as well. Okay. Um, Mr. Rice just sent me a text. He doesn't have any comments. He's, he's listening. He's still here. <laughs> um, but he, he does not have any questions or comments. So um, okay. he also thanks you um, for that. Uh, anything else from the commissioners before we wrap up? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Quill, Mr. Mitrasak, and Mr. Chamey. It's nice to see you guys, and I guess we'll see you in September, right. hopefully. Thank you all Thank very you much. So much. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time and comments. You. Okay. Ms. Kluart, thank you also. <laughs>
Um, okay, we'll um, move on to item B in the work session. And Mr. Nepti, you're leading this, right? Okay. Um, are you going to sit in front of us there? Okay. The, uh, before Mr. Nepti gets started on this, um, you know, normally I would just let the staff start. Um, but just quickly to refresh everybody's recollection um, and just to put a little bit of context before we get into some sometimes arcane conversation and um, a little bit granular. Uh, just I think the, the, count, the council, the commission um, remembers in, in um, January or early February of 2021. Um, I know Ms. Lockhart and Mr. Coleman were not here. Um, we even had a member that was on the commission then who's no longer with us. Um, he's still in the world. He's just not on this commission. Um, he, um, we raised a concern that I think had been a concern of planning commissions prior to my joining here um, for a number of years. Um, and so what we're going to talk about tonight is not new. Um, it might be the first time since I've been involved that we will talk about it, but it's something that um, has been an issue and has, has been raised, and I know what was talked about when they rewrote the zoning ordinance um, a number of years ago. But just for some, some quick context, uh, what, what we asked or what we sort of described was a number of potential really city-changing developments, um, not just in scale but in use. Um, that significantly that are that only can be significantly accomplished without any consent or assent from this body um, and as, as far as I know that's an outlier of sorts in the region um, and I don't think that every single thing we do here in the city um, development wise may need to go through this body it probably doesn't um, but certainly there can be um, our entire activity centers can theoretically be redeveloped um, without this body talking about it at all. Um, so I think I think talking about this potential issue, this issue tonight, is important not just for that reason, but I, I would argue that it promotes stability and consistency, not the opposite, and it would probably um, promote some expediency, not the opposite. Um, so I just wanted to raise that and say that as clearly as I could. I hope that was clear. Um, that is the subject of what we're doing this evening. Um, Mr. Napti was um, good enough to put together a number of scenarios for us to discuss, and I know you have a presentation also that will probably tell us why the zoning ordinance is the way it is. Um, and I don't want to guess because I wasn't there. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, I'm sure, will probably tell me if he needs to. Um, but I just wanted to throw that out there, give everybody some context, not to lose sight of the big picture when we have sort of some granular conversations um, about sort of what the objective is. So um, with that, Mr. Napti, I hope I didn't take too much of what you were going to say, um, but uh, we look forward to, to having this discussion with you. Great, thank you, Chair Ingress. That was, uh, that was very helpful, a good introduction uh, to this discussion. Um, I'll also try to provide a little bit of background for the commissioners um, and uh, explain why we're talking about special use permits in particular in regards to the concerns that uh, Chair Angris raised and that were expressed to the City Council in the letter that uh, came from the Chair with the support from the commissioners uh, last year. So uh, to provide some background, first to explain what a special use is. Um, the zoning ordinance describes it as being a use that's generally acceptable and compatible in any specific zoning district, but may have adverse effects on neighboring properties or the health, safety, or welfare of the city. And you might recall in the staff report, we provided uh, gas stations as an example of this because gas stations are um, a, uh, allowed by special use in the commercial retail district. Um, that's our most common commercial zoning district in the city. Um, and it, those districts are mostly occupied by offices, uh, retail establishments, and those kind of things. And gas stations uh, are considered commercial type of property, but they have some attributes that are different from your standard commercial properties, um, which could raise concerns about those impacts to surrounding properties. 
Um, those include things like fumes and noise and, and those types of things. So as an example, that's something that is only allowed by special use permit, um, and that allows an additional layer of review to determine if particular properties are actually appropriate for that use, even though it is considered appropriate in the district, or if it might be appropriate with some conditions applied that would help mitigate some of those impacts. Uh, some examples of uh, additional special uses. Um, they are designated by the each zoning district. And so, uh, as you know, in the zoning ordinance, we have residential zoning districts, commercial districts, and industrial districts. So some examples here are the residential of special use, special uses in residential and commercial districts. Um, we're not showing industrial districts because there aren't very many of them, and there are very few that I think would come across um, come across your path at any time. Um, but in addition to just being divided by the, the districts that they're in, um, special uses can also apply to both principal uses, uh, which are the, the main uses um, on any given site. And there is the, a table in the zoning ordinance that identifies which principal uses are allowed uh, by right or by special use permit or not at all in each district. Um, they also can apply to accessory uses, which are secondary uses that are tied to um, the, the principal uses um, on any given site. So for an example, and looking at residential, um, residential districts, principal use um, that is allowed by special use permit in, in many of the residential districts is assisted living. Um, and then a special use that's permitted in um, some of the commercial districts um, by special use permit are multifamily and mixed use buildings. Then accessory uses, as you can see, these get into much more fine grained um, less impactful types of uses. Uh, so for example, in many of the single family districts, um, daycare homes, which are um, in-home daycares that provide care for five or more children are permitted by special use permits. The, the home itself is the principal use, um, and then the daycare service is the accessory use. Uh, in commercial districts, drive-throughs are an example of an accessory use allowed by special use permits. Um, so for drive-throughs, the, the restaurant itself is the principal use, which is allowed by right, um, but drive-throughs are an accessory use um, that are only allowed by special use permit, so they would have to go through a separate process. Uh, some other examples of, of uses that are allowed by special use permit in many of the residential districts, daycare centers um, are allowed by special use along with government uses, parks and open spaces, religious institutions, schools, and bed and breakfasts. In commercial districts, some common special uses are hospitals uh, and outdoor, indoor and outdoor recreation uses. Also note that um, major utilities and telecommunications facilities are allowed by special use permits in almost all districts. So then talking about, after talking about special uses, I wanted to explain the special use permit process. Um, the uh, special use permit is required in the zoning ordinance um, to allow any special use uh, where it's defined in the underlying um, zoning district as being allowed by special use. Uh, so there's a process involved to, um, to allow somebody to, um, to have a special use on their site. Uh, and this involves a review and approval by city council with a recommendation from, uh, from city staff. Uh, specific criteria for their review of special use permits is provided in the zoning ordinance. Um, and as we noted before, the Planning Commission uh, is not um, subject to review or recommendation of special use permits to uh, City Council as they are for, um, uh, for rezonings and plan developments and other types of land uses. So to provide a little more background on, on why we're having this discussion about special use permits, as, as Mr. Angris noted, um, the letter that was submitted to City Council uh, was stated a uh, concern about uh, the Planning Commission not providing a recommendation to City Council on, on certain projects that could have a significant impact on the character of the city or significant connections to the comprehensive plan objectives. Uh, the letter also cited um, so a potential uh, special use permit uh, request at that time for an assisted living facility in a single family district. And as you know, an assisted living facility could be a multi-story building, um, often looks kind of like a multi-family building. Um, and this is something that's allowed by special use permit in a single family district. Uh, that project did not end up moving forward, but there have been subsequent projects since then uh, with similar characteristics um, that might go forward with um, only requiring a special use permit. 
So when considering uh, these concerns, uh, staff looked at several alternatives on how uh, they could be addressed through modifications to the zoning ordinance. Um, and we broke these up into two types of modifications, the first being procedural modifications, which looks at ways we could change the special use permit review process. Uh, and the second uh, process um, or second set of alternatives would look at, uh, rather than changing the special use permit review process, actually going through the use table and uh, identifying uses where um, special use permits are allow certain uses and modifying those where appropriate. We could also look at other things there. There might be cases where uses, uh, we might determine that uses are allowed by special use permit, but we think they could be allowed by right or something like that. So we could move in either direction there. Um, so I'll start though by looking at the, the options that we looked at regarding procedural modifications. Um, and also before we get to the discussion, I just wanted to note that any modifications to the zoning ordinance um, will require us going through the public hearing process and obviously require input from uh, the city council and, and likely other outreach. So the first uh, option we looked at was no change, um, which the, um, the, the impacts of that are the obvious, just continuing reviews as they are. The second is for the planning commission to review all special use permits. Um, now this would obviously allow the planning commission to become involved in anything that might be of interest. Um, that would add significantly to the caseload. Um, and also, as you saw on the earlier slide about the variety of the types of uses that can be accommodated with special use permits that could be getting involved in some of those less impactful um, types of uses and uses that uh, don't necessarily have any impact on the built environment, meaning they aren't actually um, having any, any land impacts. Uh, another option we looked at, recognizing that the, the second option might get more into the weeds than the Planning Commission could be interested in, is to review um, or have the Planning Commission review only um, special use permits that apply to the principal use. Um, so if you remember from the previous slide, we looked at like the, the assisted living facility as an example, um, the, uh, the mixed use upper story residential and a commercial district as an example, but this would eliminate um, the, uh, the accessory uses. So you wouldn't be looking at um, in-home daycares or, um, or drive-throughs or, or other types of uses like that. Uh, and then the last two uh, alternatives are both um, options where we try to use the process to identify those um, special use permits that have some kind of impact to the site. Um, meaning some kind of building expansion or redevelopment of those kind of things. So the two options, two ways of dealing with that are to identify um, those special use permits where a site plan is required. An administrative site plan is something that is usually required after the land use process, um, and that's required in any case where um, there's any disturbance to the land for the improvement to happen. Um, so again, that would eliminate in-home daycares, that would eliminate any kind of business moving into a uh, building that's already there for so another type of example are veterinary clinics um, that require special use permits if one to if a veterinary clinic were to move into a an existing building um, then that would not be subject to review but if we were, were to construct a new building that would be subject to review uh, and then the, the last one is looking at special use permits where a special exception is also required uh, along a similar vein um, this wouldn't necessarily look at those um, those cases that require site plan review, but it would pull those where a special exception is required in addition to the special use permit. Uh, and these often occur where, um, uh, where there is impact to the land because most special exceptions apply to dimensional standards that uh, impact the land. So these would be cases where there's a special use permit, but it also has a request um, for um, a special exception to maximum height or to the setbacks or those kind of things. So um, the, the difference between those last two is that the, the, those that also re request special exceptions um, tend to be the, the larger, more intensive projects because uh, they're more constrained. Um, but um, that's not to say that some projects might slip through without having to have a special exception um, that are more impactful and larger in scale. The next alternative we looked at, as I mentioned, is uh, rather than reviewing the process, is looking at the uh, use table itself. Uh, so the, um, 
the, the use table and the accessory use table are two separate tables provided in the zoning ordinance uh, that identify what uses are permitted, permitted by special use, or not permitted in each, in each zoning district. Uh, that's provided in attachment two of your staff report for reference. Uh, so permitted uses are uses that require administrative review only. They aren't required to go through any land use process, so they aren't reviewed by the Planning Commission or the City Council or any other board or commission um, unless they require a uh, Board of Architecture, architecture Review. Um, special uses, as we mentioned, those are um, required to go for the City Council for a decision, but um, do not have a venue for the Planning Commission to provide a recommendation. And then lastly, if there's no symbol shown, uh, that means a use is not permitted. Uh, so if somebody were to try to, um, to accommodate a use on a site where it's not permitted, they would have to go through a rezoning, uh, which would, um, which would mean it would come before the Planning Commission for a recommendation before going to City Council. Lastly, I wanted to state that the review process can be impacted by site conditions as well. This primarily relates to special exceptions, so uses that are permitted by right. Um, if they uh, don't meet all of the dimensional requirements of the zoning ordinance, uh, they may still re be required to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals or the City Council, uh, depending on the, uh, the number of special exceptions that they would need for those. Uh, also, in some cases, there are um, proposals that, are, that are, uh, might meet the use requirements, but that the dimensional requirements are so off from the zoning ordinance um, that there be so many special exceptions or that clearly it doesn't meet the intent of that zoning or of that zoning district um, that the applicant might choose to have a rezoning or use a plan district anyway um, in which case it would come before the planning commission uh, so this is a uh, just a piece of the the use table just shown uh, for, for example as you can see all the zoning districts are listed across the top. Uh, they're broken into not residential and non-residential categories. All the R's are residential, C's are commercial, and I's are industrial. Um, so for all the squares, a, a P um, across the columns means it is permitted, S means it's permitted by special use, and blank means it's not permitted. Uh, so if we were to go through the process of, of going through this table and determining if any of these designations should change, um, we would um, first want to identify which uses to, to reconsider, uh, and then staff would support the Planning Commission in researching each use. Uh, we would look to um, define the purpose of the designation as it is as now by going back and trying to, to find um, why it was designated that way in the original zoning ordinance. Um, we would consider potential adverse effects of each use and how they could still be considered. Uh, we would look at how peer jurisdictions review those uses and also look at approved examples um, and of course this this information could change uh, for for any type of use but that's just an example of the type of information that we would look for so then um, kind of summarizing uh, the process if we were to go through with zoning ordinance amendments um, we would first seek direction from the Planning Commission on how to proceed um, and staff would continue with research and follow with the Planning Commission on discussions of those um, we would, of course, have to have additional discussions with the, um, with, with the commission as well as city council and possible outreach to the general public. Uh, and as we stated before, that any amendments to the zoning ordinance would have to be uh, supported by the city council as well. The overall timing it would take to make these changes is dependent on the discussion, so it um, depends on the, the extent of the changes that we're making um, and the, the amount of changes that we make. And, um, so that the timing is, is pretty much in flux at this point, but we get more information once we start to move forward. Um, so that's all we have for the staff report at this point. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nabti. Um, I, th I think that's a lot um, to digest. That's just me, um, because to me there's a, a lot that goes into deciding how to give you instruction. <laughs> um, removing things from the use table takes, will take a lot of analysis, and I, I actually don't know where that ends up in the end, um, whether or not it's better for the city or not. Um, again, I don't want to lose sight of this situation. Um, so let, let me just ask you one question, Mr. Napti. Is there, do you know how many special use permits the city council heard in 2021? 
or in any recent year. I hope I didn't put you on the spot there. I, I believe I do. Uh, okay. Make sure <laughs> I find the right uh, paperwork here. Okay. So just to, to get a sense of, of what we are, are looking at, we looked at actually at every special use permit that has been reviewed by city council since the zoning ordinance was adopted in 2016. Um, and that number is uh, of all special use permits, including those that are associated with other applications like rezonings, um, those were 37 special use permits. Okay, in six years? Yes, Okay. an average of 7.4 per year. Okay. If that helps. Oh, 7.4 per year? Yeah. Okay. Um, and some of them are accessories, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, like drive throughs that, That's happened a number of times, right? Yes. Um, the reason why I asked that is because I am cognizant of potential staff issues, other types of procedural questions to be answered. Um, so I just wanted the commission to have a sense about what the scale <laughs> of what we're talking about here. Um, We've had a number of meetings that just get canceled because there's nothing to do. Um, so I don't know if it's an issue for us um, necessarily, um, but I wanted to raise that just so that we understood what it meant for the staff potentially. Um, so I think that number's helpful. Um, could, you, could you just tell us quickly, and you said you would do this depending on what um, direction we gave. What, what was the, when the zoning ordinance was rewritten, what was the impetus for leaving the planning body out and essentially what is the most central planning decisions? I mean, what, what was the purpose of that? Uh, I'll defer that to Mr. Harden. He was more involved in that process. Okay. We're all friends. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. <laughs> Chair and members. I mean, the... the the general procedure for special use permits dates back since the beginning, since the ordinance, the city originally adopted I got it. zoning. Um, and I say that generally, I can't tell you that I've, I've looked at exactly when that was. Um, it was something that was discussed when uh, the ordinance was readopted in 2016. Um, and, the, and the rationale kind of throughout the zoning ordinance at that point was we want to seek as much efficiency as we can. We want to be as streamlined as we can. We want to clean things up in the ordinance that are confusing. We want to rely more heavily on standards in the ordinance as opposed to legislative approvals. Um, and so it was discussed, but there was um, a desire not to um, to add a layer, so to speak, um, in terms of the review process. So expanding the the review of special use permits was not pursued as part of that effort. So that was done under the, the previous own, uh, previous comprehensive plan. Um, it was. It was, and um, and it wasn't obviously. A rewritten or readopted with an eye towards any of the small area plans that we're doing, probably. Um, so, you know, I think in that sense, a re re revisiting the procedure is probably a appropriate um, since it was written quite some time ago. And I, and I believe things have changed with this body, um, certainly have changed with the governing body. Um, well, so, with that, with that being said, I mean, I. I'd like to hear what the commissioners think about this. Um, there's a, I just think there's a lot to answer tonight. Um, so I, I'd like to see if I can break this down a little bit. Um, let's talk about simplicity, right? I mean, do we want to keep it, because we've been doing this for a while, <clears throat> as simple as we can, or do we want to sort of uproot it um, to achieve, you know, the most <laughs> efficient way. Uh, Mr. Coleman. My thought process is that this was adopted at a time when the city didn't even have an affordable housing plan. That's changed. The small area plans, those have changed. 
and Mr. Quill said it really well earlier. It's like growth is going to happen. Change is going to happen. It's going to shape you or you're going to shape it. And I think if this is an opportunity that we have to shape it, to put it with the comprehensive plan, that incorporates a lot of the things that we want, pedestrian friendly, safety, affordable housing, all of that, where if we are taken out of that and we are a forward-looking body, we don't have the chance to even say, hey, I think this makes sense. And it's left to, I don't want to say the whim of city council, but there's a reason the planning commission's here. It's to give that forward-looking advice to the council. And if we aren't even a part of that, what are we doing? Um, I had a similar thought in the similar context. Uh, Mr. Harden, you talked about efficiency and streamlining the process, and that's important from a tactical, from an execution standpoint, but it can potentially overlook the strategic planning standpoint, which is what this body is really for. Um, I took note of uh, this presentation that was made to the city council some months ago now by an outside consulting firm that was brought in to help look at our, our development review process. Um, it seems to me they identified a number of areas for opportunity for making some of these kind of efficiency and streamlining things and perhaps simplification and perhaps even uh, better cost recovery on the part of the city. Those discussions didn't involve the Planning Commission at all, which kind of baffled me a little bit. But it, it tells me there are plenty of other opportunities to achieve those efficiency and streamlining goals um, and this may present an opportunity for us to bring back into it some of the strategic oversight and thinking, which is the role of the Planning Commission. It's not really a question, it's just an observation of how this development review process is kind of being looked at. Perhaps um, in disparate sections, it maybe should be thought about a little bit more comprehensively. Um, so, and that's kind of my perspective. I think we can achieve both goals and still have a better process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to second what Mr. Hardin said about why we went about rewriting the zoning ordinance. Uh, I was a participant in that process. And when this process came up, it was pointed out that our zoning ordinance was very old, dating back to the 1970s. It had been amended so many times that there were contradictions within the zoning ordinance at that time. You know, one part would say one thing and another part would contradict that totally. So that it was time for a rewrite. I will add that when we went through the contractor selection process and then the process of rewriting the zoning ordinance, it was pounded up, pointed out at a number of meetings that we were not going to get a perfect document when we were done. That it was a document that was going to be updated to the best of our ability. Uh, it was updated by an outside contractor who was not conversant with all of the nuances within the city of, of various things that are local. And as such, that there was an expectation that while we got a brand new document, one of the things we would start looking at were how to improve that document and tailor it to the city of Fairfax. And I believe from the number of zoning ordinance amendments we have made since that time, that that's exactly what we have been doing. And I think it has been beneficial to go through that process. I think also though, that when we went through it, we came up with the best document we could but we also understood there were going to be unintended consequences, which we have heard in some of the zoning text amendments that we have amended, which we have heard in various of the processes that come up and which are embedded in the letter that we sent to staff and to council, because prior to this latest iteration where we were not going to be included in the property that was discussed in the chairman's letter, 
we had been involved with reviewing that property, I believe, two occasions prior to that in the discussion of who and how it was going to proceed. So streamline, yes, but eliminate us from important elements of what are being looked at was no. That was not an intended consequence. So cutting us out of the special exception process, that's correct because there were no special exceptions that I can remember that came through that were major projects in the city that had not come through the Planning Commission at that point. And the Planning Commission and its review of projects had had the opportunity through all of the tools available to us, be it the comprehensive plan, be it the capital improvement process, be it any of the major processes the city went through, took the opportunity to be forward-looking. And one example I will cite is that the city used to have its own water department and its own water treatment facility. And the Planning Commission in the CIP process, I believe, started looking at that two years prior to the city grappling with the issue and several years prior to the final decision. So it's not a matter that the Planning Commission has not been involved making recommendations on important elements in the city. So that at this time, I think we don't want to, to set back the process by causing the city to add a lot of staff, a lot of unnecessary cost to applicants, a lot of unnecessary time and effort on projects that need to move forward. But when it comes to major projects, such as the one that was referenced in the chairman's letter, to be eliminated from the process, I don't think was our intention either. So I think looking at an option that would modify this process so that those major projects, which do impact the terms stated in the letter, should give us the opportunity to comment, not approve necessarily, but to comment on those kinds of projects that affect the major character issues. Now, as we have seen in a recent development decision, we can have an opinion that is contrary to the final approval of a project. And I don't think that hurts our credibility. I don't think it hurts the value we add to reviewing the process. And I don't think it necessarily muddies the water so much that we should be eliminated in the name of streamlining the process. So from that standpoint, I would think there is something that we can do to target those projects which should come through us for at least comment because they do impact the elements we lay out. And I will re I remind you that the Planning Commission is the responsible party for the comprehensive plan. The spin-offs that have come out of that, the recommendation for small area plans. That's not a staff issue, that's not uh, a council issue that we be directed. It's something we worked on together with staff to develop as a recommendation. The fact book is something that we went through the comp plan process and had all of the data there. And it was in coordination with staff that we recommended that, that be split out of the comprehensive plan and made a standalone document so that we could keep the comprehensive plan where uh, it was easily usable by the potential user base. The six-month review or annual review of projects and how we were coming along was also spread out as an attachment to the comprehensive plan, not a major part of it. So I think the evolution that has gone on in the Planning Commission in our dealing with issues uh, has been useful in keeping the Planning Commission relevant to its purpose. And this glaring error, as I would view it, is something that I think can be adjusted 
so that it keeps the process streamlined and so that it keeps the process effective. I don't think it needs to add a huge amount of extra cost in either uh, people's time on the staff, which would result in the addition of a staff person, in a cost that would drive potential applicants away because they're not going to bear whatever that administrative cost would be uh, out. I think all of that can be accomplished as we move forward and meet the intent of the letter we sent. Thank you. Thank you. Would either one of you like to follow that up? Okay. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll ask a quick question. Um, I, I know with, with deference to, you know, respecting staff time and also appreciating that you had some respect for our time in terms of the workload, um, is the use of joint sessions between council and planning commission kind of not something that's, that's traditionally done or is that a tool that could be leveraged more when some of these projects do come up in the future? Am I putting myself in jeopardy here? No. <laughs> um, there, there, that's, that's true. Um, <clears throat> there has been joint work sessions in the past. It is a practice in the last few years that we've moved away from. Um, I think there was, I think there's a few, few aspects of that. One, there's kind of a, a practical piece of, 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 of your time or the council's time. Someone has to show up on a night that's not their night to be here, um, which, you know, seems like a small thing, but, but actually those that did the joint sessions, it's, we ask a lot of your time already. Um, and asking you then to show up again, I think, is a challenge. That's kind of on the practical side, more on the kind of policy aspect. I think there was um, some perception that, that there's, um, it wasn't the most comfortable forum for either body to kind of share more candidly what their thoughts are. And because and truly the role of the planning commission, the role of council are different. Um, and, you know, blending those together to some level kind of, you know, dissipates what the differences are in those roles. Um, and I think on the planning, planning commission side in particular, there was a desire to, to be able to talk kind of amongst yourselves um, as a body, collect your thoughts on it before you make a recommendation to the council. Not that you would be at a work session. Um, but having that opportunity to kind of talk um, independently, I think, was an important aspect. Um, certainly, something that you know we can always think through. You know, if some you know something has changed in that regard. But those are some of the issues that we ran into. Sure. I'm just thinking in terms of the number of sessions that need to be held for a particularly large project. But I mean, I I to your point about the different roles, I see the planning commission as stewards of that comprehensive plan of of stewards of the planning process for the city. And the council, of course, is responsible to their constituents, the people who are electing them. I understand the division of labor there. But what has, I'll say surprised, could be disappointed, but I'll say surprised me the most in about a year on, on planning commission now is because of the sort of interjection of special use permits or these, these sort of decisions that get made outside the normal channel or what I would consider the normal planning channel, we're not able to evaluate things holistically. Um, we, we get pieces of different development slates, right? Or um, we potentially are only looking at pieces of development slates when it comes to the small area plans or major swaths of development. So perhaps that's a metric that we consider. Is this a special use permit that is adjacent to things that we are re reviewing? Because then we do you know, set aside a whole category of things to look at that do impact each other. Um, I'm still in favor, technically, of reviewing everything. I, I cautiously say that seven per year doesn't seem <laughs> excessively undue uh, in terms of commissioner time, but Four if the score was a minor, you wouldn't see it there. Wouldn't see it, right. So, um, but I mean, I think those are the those sort of ability to look at things in service of the comprehensive plan. I think that's what <coughs> remain our goal in terms of how we add these to our plate. Thank you, Ms. Lockhart, well said. Uh, Mr. Eftikari. So I just took some notes here just to follow up on our, my fellow commissioners' comments here. I mean, 
the Planning Commission's goal was is to provide the mayor and the council, um, you know, advisory on land use policies and plans, which the overall goal is orderly, balanced, and equitable city growth, right? And particularly as it relates or it applies in, in the 2035 comprehensive plan, which we're stewards of and so forth. But s since my time on the commission, I always sense that there's a, a minority that feels the commission has outlived the, the usefulness, its usefulness as, as planning has been integrated more into government operations, um, since planning is now looked at as, as a logically a, a normal function of a governing body and should be a direct staff function and not and not the council. So, I mean, it's it's if if you look at the surrounding jurisdictions and cities, the planning commissions are are highly sought out. Their opinions, they're involved. They're you know they, they're, there's never a letter that's needed to submit it by a chairman to to say hey look we mean something we <laughs> we deserve some some respect. I mean they provide a form in which planning matters are considered on their own merits. It provides uh, a stable continuity of policy. It ensures planning studies and proposals are developed on their own merits and given a, a complete public hearing before transmitted to the city. Um, it also provides a place where citizens come here and they, they voice their in, and, 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 and express their interest in the well-being and the a future development of our community um, before it becomes a political issue and so forth. So I think that, you know, things that, we, that we're talking about here today are, are, are just another dig in terms of you know, taking away um, the the efficacy and, and the, the critical function of the, of the commission, and I, I, I I'm totally against it. I, I I'm, uh, you know, that's just my my comments. Thank you, Mr. Eftikari. Um, Mr. Rice. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, had a couple of casual conversations with some folks from other jurisdictions. Um, who were involved in planning and they were not aware uh, the degree to which we were not reviewing um, the same sorts of projects that they would routinely review. Um, I think in, in, with a goal of efficiency in mind, uh, one thing we would want to present to developers is a process that looks the same in the county as it does in the city. Uh, and I think the continuity in terms of making that process the same would benefit everybody. Um, another just practical observation over the last, you know, two and a half years is that city council members do seek out our opinion when we have big projects. Um, it seems to me that they do depend on having an assessment and having an opinion from us uh, to be able to back up their own thoughts and I think uh, that we would not um, artificially constrain the process or slow it down. We might, in fact, make it more efficient and speed it up. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Um, I think I'm not sure I could say much more. Um, I, I will say that um, the idea about some consistency, I know has been a, um, a source of consternation for staff sometimes <laughs> um, with city policy. Um, and I do believe with the right people on this body that consistency in following our plans, I hope, um, is more likely. Um, and that some stability will also be interjected into that process. I think also Ms. what Ms. Lockhart said is something that I intended to say, but uh, about the holistic sort of look, right? So if you're, I'll take, just, let's just take for example, I'll use this as an example. There was at, at a time during the breezeway iterations, there was a proposal, I think to build a, is it four story or five story? I don't remember how many, but a building on the breezeway site that was, um, I forget the use, was it a senior over 55 restricted use like that? Um, and to me at the time, uh, you know, I'll admit I was more worried because it was my first day as chair, best making and just not messing up. Um, so I was sort of less concerned with policy that day. But um, it, it occurred to me and I thought about it afterwards and it was too late. Should we have had a discussion at all um, 
about whether or not you know a, a use like that on the boulevard is appropriate, right? So that's not a special use. That was not a special use. That was part of a, a planned development district. But just an, an opportunity to follow up on things that may or may not uh, you know, affect the future development of the city. Um, and those things can happen in the, in the context of special use, for sure. Um, and so you know, that thing, that's something to me that sort of is how I would sort of characterize how I've thought about the holistic sort of planning. Um, it takes away even that opportunity. Now, I could have come to you guys and said, I'm hearing what the council's doing. You know, maybe we should talk about these policy effects. You know, that's, that's okay. Um, but I do think having a public sort of airing of that is probably a better process for the commission than to just have private conversations with staff about that. Um, so, you know, I would just, I would just sort of uh, finish up with this before we sort of get to a recommendation. Um, and I'm looking at the principal use table. So actually, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the accessory use table. So there's, I only count one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe. That was just a quick count. A special use in that whole table, right? Um, so if we didn't, you know, I'm not sure having us to see all the special uses would add all that much. There's really not that many in the, in the, in the um, accessory use. And the principal use there obviously is more, but those, you know, if, if you look at, let's see, the first page of the principal <laughs> use, the non-residential districts in the residential column for use types, you have a special use permit for multifamily upper story residential mixed uses in the commercial retail district, right? Um, I think almost all the activity centers, except for Old Town, is mostly CR, right? Um, so you're talking, I mean, to me, that's the most glaring example. You're talking about a significant change in, that, in the character of that area, um, a significant change in um, use characteristics and potential density. Um, and I think that that is sort of one of the better examples of how we've spent a ton of time making sure that the plans are, are smart for those areas, um, consistent with the comp plan, forward looking. Uh, and it, it is only sort of to me natural that the planning body would be responsible for the huge development that would happen in those areas that we planned for. Um, so, you know, that, that's sort of my take on it. I've been at this a long time, and I've had a lot of takes. <laughs> um, so I, I don't want to sort of elaborate any more. Um, I will ask – yeah, go ahead, Mr. Mr. Arden. I, I, I was just going to offer, Mr. Chair, um, and, and we – and I may just be saying it something again that you read in the staff report and that Mr. Nabti mentioned earlier, but the idea from a zoning perspective behind special use permits – is that these are uses that are compatible and they're uses that aren't extremely impactful or character defining or a huge transition from what the underlying district provides for um, you know but for some some potential aspects that that may have some externalities on you know other properties or the neighborhood in general and so you know from from our perspective, when you talk about you know character defining significant things in a special use permit, you know maybe that's what needs to be examined. Perhaps a special use permit is not the appropriate tool for some of the uses that the commission has identified as as fitting within that category. And that's something that we can talk about. But that's that's part of our challenge, I think, right. in terms of how we uh, implement the ordinance. Yeah, I understand that. I know that you raised that to me. Um, and deciding whether or not, you know, those types of uses need or will require rezoning in the future is perhaps part of the analysis, right? Um, well, answer me this then, you know, because I, I look at this sentence in, in Mr. Napti's staff report and it says, and this is this is the standard for special use, right? Um, Due to their nature, design, or location may have potential for adverse impacts on adjacent land uses or the health, safety, or welfare of the city. I mean, to me, that's a description of what this body does. Um, so, I, you know, we can talk, we can talk about removing some of the special uses in the principal table. 
Um, what I am concerned about, and maybe this is what you're going to say, Mr. Cunningham, is that that also may have some unintended consequences. I, I don't know what those would be quite yet, um, Mr. Mr. Cunningham. Thank you. Uh, yes, and looking at some of the issues and a couple that have been touched on here. One, I am not aware that the city has a written policy that we will have no residential on Fairfax Boulevard. And yet I am keenly aware through Rocky Gorge, through the projects up through the breezeway that include Paul VI, that we have never approved residential on Fairfax Boulevard. So when we get down to balancing special use in some of this, we have gotten to an area where we are now proposing to build major mixed use processes and projects on areas of the city and mixed use may be as little as 5,000 square feet or less of the total project when it is a several hundred thousand foot project. So we have never really gotten around to defining what mixed use is other than you've got two uses there. We don't have a standard for a balance or some things like that. And I think that's where one the deliberative process has come in with the Planning Commission and the City Council as to what we want to happen. So um, I have to disagree a, a, a little bit. Okay. Um, previously in the comprehensive plan before 2019, um, there was not a prohibition. Uh, I, I shouldn't use that term. There's not a recommendation for no residential along Fairfax Boulevard. There was kind of an understanding, maybe it was an unwritten, unspoken sort of thing. There was also language in the comprehensive plan that talked about consideration of residential uses where they're obsolete or, you know, unviable uses along Fairfax Boulevard. But in the 2019 version of the comp plan, it actually does say in the commercial corridors, residential uses are not recommended. Now that doesn't include all of Fairfax Boulevard because some of Fairfax Boulevard is, is in the activity centers, which does speak to residential um, or mixed uses. So there have been, you know, and maybe this is the earlier point, there have been some different policy decisions that have been made um, since even since 2016 when the ordinance was rewritten. So perhaps taking a look um, at the use table and the use structure through that lens is, is something that's a worthwhile endeavor for, and for the commission to, and for staff. It comes down to the interpretation of language, not recommended versus the word prohibited. Right. Well, and, and, and when we get to those things, what we've done is try to leave as much gray area as possible so that we can work with the options that are presented to us. And, and th there's certainly a higher threshold for a rezoning action for a special use compared to a special use permit. But this goes action. back to the breezeway and Mr. Angris's comment about considering a senior living facility on the commercial portion of the property where you would have a senior living facility or an age restricted along with uh, two over twos along with townhouses for an essentially all residential project which did not receive favorable treatment. Correct. So, so using that as an example, um, in, in the 2016 rewrite, the flexibility of the plan development districts was dramatically increased. Um, and has pushed much more development into plan districts, which come under the purview of the Planning Commission, than ever was the case um, before, just because it offered, it was a better, more effective tool for the development um, industry, and it allows um, a higher level of review at the city. Um, and, you know, as a built out place with kind of complex sites, um, it allowed 
you know, those peculiarities to be addressed. You know, before that, a number of those developments um, would have been a special use permit, perhaps in a commercial district, um, or maybe a special use permit and a rezoning on portions and special use permit on another. So, you know, it wasn't looked in isolation at that time to say, you know, we're systematically trying to remove the planning commission from the conversation. It was what tools are going to be the most effective and how can we be the most consistent about what we're doing? You know, also before 2016, the BZA looked at special use permits. Um, you talk about being confusing. Somebody walks through the door, wait, now who? <laughs> Who's looking at this? Okay, it's a special use permit in this district. It's going to city council. It's a special use for this in this district. It's going to the BZA. So there, there really was an effort to say, you know, this is this is too too complicated um, for um, you know for our our city for our process. Um, but you know, to your to your point, Mr. Cunningham, we we acknowledge that it wasn't going to be perfect, and we would have to live with it. And as Commission knows we've been back with text amendments every year, um, and we will continue to do that. So it's certainly something that we, um, you know, we're happy to, to take a look at and work with the commission on. We just want to be careful about how we're going about it, and that we are addressing specifically what the commission's looking for, and not, you know, casting a wider net than need be. Thank you. We've come a long way. We ain't done yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll follow up quickly, and then and then we'll get to a recommendation. Uh, just on Mr. Rice's point, I when I joined the commission, I this is just sort of this is me. I'm not sort of speaking for anybody else. I didn't really hear from council members about what I thought about rezonings, um, and maybe it's because I didn't have anything to think about. I don't know, um, but I thought I did. Uh, but it's changed pretty, in my view, um, significantly. And I think, like, like Mr. Rice said, I, I do think they actually have changed to want it. Um, and I don't think that they don't want it in circumstances that are not rezonings. Um, so I just I wanted to make that point. Um, I wanted to just broach something to the commission about what to tell the staff to do. Um, it seems like it may be worth it to examine the use table um, to see if some of those uses that are permitted by special use um, should be rezoned. Um, but I also think at the same time, um, we're going to need a process that allows us some authority in special use, um, you know, in, for circumstances that may not be appropriate um, in that rezoning. That also could have potential, you know, consequences, and I don't know how to work that out exactly. Um, but that sort of seems to me that uh, a way to start. Um, does anybody have any comments on that, Ms. Lockhart? I'm not sure that the overhauling the use table is necessarily going to achieve the goal that we want because. As you using the most recent drive-through example, right? That ended up being a far more contentious issue with council than perhaps it would seem on paper, being just adding a drive-through window to a restaurant. So, there's the context. I think is more important for these requests than purely the the content of the request. So, unless there's some glaring <laughs> examples of things that are currently permitted that should never be permitted via special use, I don't know that amending the table will make. A difference in terms of how how and when things are presented to the commission versus the council. Do you have a <coughs> response to that? I mean, I. Right. We we've said in the staff report, right. Mr. Chair. I've said to you multiple times as staff. No, we're we're not supportive of of you know looking at you know special use permits blanket review and, and recommendation or approval of the Planning Commission. That doesn't mean we won't respond to the direction that the Planning Commission provides and put together the materials that you need, but no, that's that's not something that we see as productive. We we do see looking at the the table and examining, you know, <laughs> what's in there through the lens of the comprehensive plan um, and how that aligns or doesn't align with with the vision and the recommendations of the plan, we think that 
that is valuable and, and does have does uh, align with the role of of the commission in ensuring that that land use is moving forward as um, as was outlined in the plan. So you know, respectfully, would yeah. would would disagree. I'm not okay, Mr. Coleman. When Mr. Navity was giving his presentation, I kind of naturally gravitated towards option four that was presented, which was the site plan anytime you're going to have, because that's really where you're going to have a big impact. And it's like, okay, you have a gas station that becomes a coffee house. Who cares? I mean, yes, that's a big change, but it's like the building's still there. It's just being repurposed. And I don't know, I think the vague nature of it, it's like generally... A, like what is, what is it the generally the same use or something like that where are generally compatible like what defines gen like you've got a lot of leeway there so I understand wanting to be efficient but I I also respectfully just disagree going to catch all of them and I don't think we're looking for a catch-all because there's no such thing as a catch-all but I think <coughs> if we're looking towards those bigger projects North Fax, Camp Washington those are the ones where you're gonna have ground disturbed and quite frankly we want that we don't want a parking lot there anymore so that's kind of my general draw towards that one is it we're not looking at drive-throughs all the time um, and we're kind of more on the big picture yeah, I, I'm still not sure what the right answer I agree with mr. Harden that we don't want to review every special use permit but the, the drive-throughs are a great example there are some things in the use table that you know do I do I really and, the, and that's under the special exceptions. Maybe, maybe special exceptions we don't want to touch at all. I'm not sure, but uh, that may not be the case. We talk about major home occupant uh, occup occupations in some locations. But um, do I care if there's uh, a theater in a an otherwise commercial district anyway? Probably not, because it's generally a commercial venture anyway in a commercial area. I'm not sure what makes the theater particularly different. So I, I think it's it's a question of coming up with a some kind of other criteria or criteria. It must, it's more than can be more than one of, of what the impacts are. I don't know what generally compatible means e either. How those judgments were made when this table was first put together, but in the same context, saying but may have significant impacts. Those two are just don't they they. They, they disagree in my mind that if it's generally compatible, it can't be particularly impactful. Otherwise, it's not generally compatible. So I, I think we just need to sort through that language and you know, revisit some of the things in the use table, but um, not a whole rewrite. I'm not looking at every one of these for sure. Telecommunications facilities, in fact, I think there's legislation at the state level that you know, we can tr control a little bit about what some of these look like, but not whether they're there, right? So, I mean, that. The Planning Commission doesn't need to look at that. The Board of Architecture Review has because we're sticking the cell phone tower somewhere. But uh, so I, I still don't know what the right answer is, but I still think we should pursue um, some more homework to try to figure out what the what the right approach would be. But. So just on, on the comment about the drive-through, I could say we don't want to look at every special use permit, but. Again, it's back to what, our, what, what the Fairfax City Planning Commission goal is to provide ad advocacy and uh, on that will result in orderly, balanced, and equitable city growth, right? So what about the neighbor that lives behind that restaurant that has to deal with all the yelling into that window like to order a chicken sandwich, right? What about, what about the parking? What about the, the, the line of cars that, you know, right? So, what, what's the forum that they're going to have? They can come and tell us, and we can say, hey, you know, you, you know, what you're saying doesn't make sense, or it does make sense. So, while I agree, like we shouldn't look at every single one, I think this is just another chip at kind of like what 
you know what what we really stand for and what we're supposed to do. So you know that's why I, I'm in complete disagreement. Any other comments? One last comment. I can go along with Mr. Coleman and, and item number four, looking at those special use permits that come in and that are significant. Uh, I think his example was the gas station that becomes Dunkin' Donuts because that one is for real and we have done it <laughs> on Main Street. Uh, so th those kinds of things do go on. I think we have examples for everything we have talked about that has gone on in the city because we have a small town and we are all somewhat impacted by the changes that occur. Uh, so the changes are going to continue. There were no drive throughs downtown in the Courthouse Plaza Shopping Center because that was politically unpalatable. <laughs> Therefore, Chick-fil-A is over on Fairfax Boulevard across from Scout on the Circle. Uh, so all of this turns into something that's practical application that is somebody's dollars, somebody's disruption, somebody's business, somebody's impact on a neighbor. And I think, I think the major things that come along, uh, and I think the one site that we were talking about and referenced in the letter has perhaps had four different projects come in and review it now. I think the Planning Commission was involved in the first three and has heard about the fourth one. Uh, so something that's major that has an impact along that line to, to neighbors and the function of the city in that, I think needs to, needs to come back through the body for consideration for fitting with the overall comprehensive plan. The fact that the city council's attention span or vision typically has been defined as two years to maybe four years and the planning commission's guideline and, and vision has been really don't care about much less than five years unless it's an actual project going on to out to 25 or 30 years means that we're looking at different things which we we do have different roles so uh, this reconciliation i think is something can be found I think that Mr. would be compatible i made a really good point too that we shouldn't be so arrogant as to presume that planning council Planning Commission review means we're going to change the decision, right? Or that we're going to no, no. give them the answer. Like, you know, but to your point about neighbors being able to weigh in, I, I look at the dispensary that's being built out in the <laughs> pharmacy, and I, I believe that's by right because the state treats pharmacies and dispensaries as one and the same. But I would venture to guess that neighbors probably would have liked to have a forum to just ask questions. I mean, the project right? that was briefed to us <laughs> as a Wawa without yeah. a gas station? Yeah. Um, so, you know, where, where is the, the dialogue in terms of how these projects, whether they go forth or not, fit into the fabric of the city? Mr. Nabdi, can I ask you, before we finish up, one question about number four. Um, I think it's A2. Um, what, would be an in, what would be an example there? Um, let me see if I can th think of one. I, I didn't have any uh, necessarily set up, but um, go through my list here. See if I can pull one out. Um, just as an example, the Westmore. Dog park is the first one I saw. Um, didn't require any rezoning action, required a special use permit, and obviously impacted the land, so it required a site plan. So that would be identified. So that would be, you know, I mean, what, what, what would it require? I think um, Mr. Napti's um, comment earlier on the animal care facilities. Okay. Um, oftentimes move into existing spaces don't require a whole lot of physical construction beyond you know within the, the walls of the building um, so something like that that is a special use permit but isn't gonna so a site plan is 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 required when there's land si more significant land disturbance um, and so something like that may not 
trigger that. Um, <laughs> that's the one that I'm coming up with for principal uses. We were talking about principal uses, right, on that one? Yes. Okay, just wanted an example of what that was. I have a question about that option. You talk one of the drawbacks says that requires staff to proactively identify when a major site plan review will be required. Don't don't you already do that? Is, is that additional effort to determine what whether a site plan major site plan review is required or not? Oftentimes we do, Mr. Feather, um, like a number of things with. Uh, applications when they initially come in sometimes that's not as clear as you might think it would be so there are times when that isn't a part of the discussion and there is a line between what's a minor site plan versus what's a major site site plan and that um, is there is some judgment there on behalf of the zoning administrator for the city to make that determination so and the use might be more important um, I, I hope, <laughs> I mean, clearly our, our intent is clear. Um, I think we, in my view, tried to have as an informative discussion as possible. I don't think, in my view, that this is a, there's <coughs> nothing simple about this at all. Um, I think it's pretty clear what we believe the sort of role of the commission is. Um, I think you definitely have heard that there's some um, support for not having every special use. Um, although for sure, I think what I heard, even though it wasn't said in that way, was that perhaps maybe we should. Um, that those other small uses do, can have significant effects, um, however we define them. Um, just because they're not a giant building doesn't mean that they don't affect a lot of people. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, We've had a good conversation. Do you need to ask us more questions? I mean, this is something that I think we've got a good start on. It may require some additional time with us um, after you've thought about it a little bit more, um, which you know we're happy to do. Um, so have you gotten enough today to start? Maybe? I, I, I believe so. I think okay. we could come back at that next okay. conversation and ask questions that okay. may come up. Yeah, Ms. Lucker. Sorry, one more question. Um, this is obviously in response to a letter that was sent by council. So I assume council then turned around and said, staff, give us some options. Is that what happened? Or does count the city council have an idea of what they might like to see, what would be most helpful to them to be coming from the commission? I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the letter that we sent to the council was not responded to. Um, it was not responded to by the staff and it, well, we talked about it. It was not formally responded to. Um, and the mayor nor account, any council member formally s responded. Um, there were some, some comments were made to me about it, but there was not a sort of formal process that we went through, correct, Mr. Hardin? That, that's correct. Where it was, so we had, I've been working with the staff over time to develop this sort of, uh, and the council is aware now, but at the time, I don't think reacted to it would be my sort of understanding. So, And we would, you know, as this conversation continues with the Planning Commission, like we do on all zoning text amendments, we'd have conversation as staff with the, with the council as well. Sure. I guess I'm just thinking, ideal state, they would be able to articulate what is most helpful to them coming out of the commission from a recommendation perspective, and that might help guide us to where we should best devote our efforts. But... If that's not happening, then here we are. <laughs> that was the intent, I think. But we ended up in a different spot. So um, no one's fault. Uh, Mr. Rice, do you have any additional questions? Um, <clears throat> I don't really have enjoyed uh, listening to the feedback and the other opinions. You know, I think my opinion boils down to uh, seeing big projects, such as the one on the Davies property or others, uh, bypass us it just seems that we need to implement something whether it's you know selection four or something different uh to avoid um not being able to help the city by providing a review and feedback to council and frankly i think council uh would benefit from that and many of them would like it um 
I have to agree. I, I, I find myself, other than being sick and not being there in person, I, I find myself really uncomfortable um, disagreeing with Mr. Hardin or Mr. Nabti because I don't think that's ever happened. It's been years um, of, of just, uh, I think we have a very good relationship as a commission and, and uh, the city staff is fantastic, but um, I hope that we can find a way to, uh, to provide feedback on things that will change the city and also to, um, to do it in a way that doesn't generate unnecessary work. Um, that's all I have to say, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Rice. And, and, and yes. if I may, absolutely, um, Mr. Chair, completely yeah. acceptable for us to disagree on things from time to time. Staff and the Planning Commission Council, we all have different roles, so that's why the process is is set up that we each have a have a part to play. So, okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Harden, for bringing this to us, and Mr. Nabti for listening to me for a long time um, about this. Um, so I, I want to thank the commissioners. If there's, if there's nothing else, um, I think we will let uh, Mr. Hardin and Mr. Napti go home. Um, and I, I want to thank everybody for a good conversation. I know that's a lot to tackle. Um, uh, it's just not a simple subject. So um, I do want to thank Mr. Cunningham especially. I thought that was extremely articulate and well articulated. Um, and uh, probably, you know, very helpful that you have gone through this process um, to be able to sort of guide us on that. So thanks. Um, okay, we will close that and move to. I don't have my agenda, but I'm sure it's reconvening the regular meeting and moving to the staff report. Uh, Mr. Nabti, a little less stress for you. <laughs> Thank you again, Mr. Chair, member of the Planning Commission. Um, just a, a quick summary of a couple items for that will be on the agenda for tomorrow night's city council meeting. They will be holding a public hearing on the zoning text amendments that were presented to you, uh, that you provided your recommendation to them at the last meeting on. They'll also receive the same work session presentation on the Camp Washington Small Area Plan that you received tonight. Uh, a couple other items that might be of interest, they'll be holding a public hearing on abolishing the Community Appearance Committee. Um, this is a committee that has had infrequent meetings uh, due to a lack of discussion topics recently and low membership. Um, it was requested by the committee to consider this. Um, some of the duties that the committee was responsible for will be taken by the Environmental Sustainability Committee and the Sustainability Staff. This includes um, cleanup efforts, invasive removals, and those kind of things. Um, the members who are on that committee as of now uh, will be encouraged or have been encouraged to fill vacancies on other boards and commissions. Um, as you know, we don't have any vacancies right now, but we might see some, you might be aware of some other movements that are happening around with those members and hopefully they will stay involved with the city. Uh, two other work session items that are related to recommendations in the comprehensive plan or small area plans are um, a work session on uh, identifying locations for uh, bike share and a work session on a redesign of the Eaton Place Chambers Road intersection, which I believe we discussed last time as a recommendation in the North Fax Small Area Plan uh, that was assumed to be a traffic circle at that time, but that design has been reanalyzed and determined that it would not function as desired, so City Council is now looking at <laughs> some alternative designs for that. Um, we wanted to make sure the Planning Commission is aware of a technical assistance panel study that will be led by the Virginia Urban Land Institute, focusing on the southwest quadrant of Fairfax Circle. This will be held August 30th and 31st. Um, we are still working with ULI to determine what our role will be. Uh, they have not determined if um, participation from the Planning Commission will be required, but if they do ask for a representative, then we will let you know as soon as possible. Uh, we'll have to do that through email, since as you know, this is our last meeting before the August recess. Um, so we will reach out to you as needed. Uh, aside from that, just wanted to wish everyone a good recess and uh, look forward to seeing you again in September. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nepti. Uh, questions for Mr. Nepti? Okay. Uh, council, uh, council, commission comments, Mr. Coleman. I just wanna say uh, good discussion, I think, tonight and uh, hope everybody has a good August. Mr. Feather. Uh, thank you. Um, 
the Board of Architecture review did not meet at all in July. And as a consequence, there will need to be a special meeting in August to take care of some business that needed to be addressed. Um, I do want to uh, commend Mr. Angris and his family, as well as some of his neighbors, for yesterday having a kids run lemonade stand and cookie sale to support the Lamb Center as a local charity. It was a good citizenship and good neighborhood, uh, good neighborhood activity. And I as well also wish everybody a good August recess. Thank you, Mr. Feather, very much. Uh, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, I will say I hope everyone has a happy and healthy August recess, and I look forward to seeing you in September. Thank you. Right. Mr. Eftikari. Yeah, no comments for me. Enjoy your summer. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Lockhart. Uh, thanks again to Mr. Harden, Mr. Nabti, and Chairman Andrus for working this issue in, in radio silence. <laughs> Appreciate that it's difficult to kind of push your way forward, but I think it's, it's a discussion worth having, so thank you. <coughs> thank you, Ms. Lockhart. Uh, Mr. Rice. Uh, the uh, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board met uh, and we spent a bit of time uh, looking at Tice Park and um, uh, and the potential redesign um, and layout and I believe that that has been presented to uh, the Planning Commission. Um, there are some cost estimates and uh, planning that needs to be done on the front end because of the um, issue of uh, increasing costs for materials and some uncertainty in the budget um, for that. I think more on that um, over time. Uh, probably the most substantial um, thing that uh, has happened with uh, PRAB is that Kathy Salgado has uh, had her last uh, meeting with us and so she uh, is retiring and a replacement is um, being interviewed for her position um, and so there has been a um, a number of candidates um, who are in the process of uh, being interviewed by uh, city staff and others and um, and there may be more news uh, in the future about who may take her place um, I uh, think that's about it uh, thank you very much okay thank you mr. rice um... Yeah, thank you to the commissioners uh, for you know tackling a difficult topic. Um, also, good comments for Camp Washington, um, and again, thank you to, to Mr. Napti and Mr. Hardin um, for for the, the the hard work on this so far. So, um, with that, everybody have a have, please have a good August. Um, if I have if my kids have another lemonade stand and cookies, I will let all of you know. <laughs> um, but they did raise a hundred dollars for the the Lamb Center. Um, so we haven't brought it there yet, but we will. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a good August. We'll see you in September. We are adjourned.